uh, provides evidence.
Hi, Dr. Rajesh Kathrotia, additional professor. Hi, Dr. Rajesh Kathrotia, I'm additional professor in Department of Physiology and the Organizing Secretary. Physiology and Pharmacology of Ames Rajkot. I would like to take the pleasure to welcome our today's special invitee. Guest of honor, Dr. Rajesh Trivedi, sir. Medical acting president of is also member committee of all the speakers for the day, Dr. Pradeep Burde from A. H. Varun. Speakers for the day. We hope that now I, I would like to, start to state the objective. Aspects. Delegates who have represented, who are who have joined, not only from India, even from abroad and all the other places also, and we have got a very overwhelming response, and more than thousand registrations have occurred to attend this program. That itself uh, states the importance of the topic. That the people who are cutting across various streams, where things uh, not only from physiology and pharmacology, but from other streams, have also. Made it a point to attend. Then this uh, webinar perhaps has something to offer to them. That is why they have registered for this webinar. So I thank each and every delegate who has taken the time out to be a part of it, to motivate the team, to take us together. Now I would like to talk a little bit why we chose this theme. Uh, the body composition is something that uh, is something is an understatement, especially in the context of Southeast Asian countries. We know that many of the diseases and many of the afflictions that our society is suffering from, it is because of the unique genetic disposition that we have in this part of the world. And also the dietary habits and the physical inactivity, which has tremendously contributed to so many of the non-communicable disorders on the top of the infectious pandemic COVID-19 that we all are suffering from. So considering that we chose a topic where we can address to how we can take care of the body compass, what is exactly what, what is afflicting our part of the world, then what are the various exercise regimen, what are the various exercise 
things, physical activity that can help us to modify those genetic uh, factors and can help us to become a better uh, and a healthier being. And also how to help, how this will help us even in this COVID-19 pandemic, how to become fit. And then the, what are the drugs, what are the updates that have come? How this exercise regimen, all the physiological aspects can be combined with the drugs that are, are, are being done right now in the, and what are the various updates on that, that we can do it. So we have tried to, uh, try to take both the components, the physiological and the pharmacological components where we would like to address what are the various things we can do at the both at the pharmacological and the non-pharmacological non level and how we can take it forward. Another uh, reason for having this topic is that since it is under the APPI Gujarat chapter, we wanted that we can have the activities not only for the namesake with the physiological aspects only, where we would like to take it forward and we'd like to see that many of the research components are also explored uh, by not only the people who are, who are a part of this on the organizing team, but we can welcome uh, the other, uh, other uh, participants who are representing their institutes and we can do some sort of the multi-centric research studies where these people are also invited. So I heartily welcome all those who find something and some sort of topic uh, and uh, the something where we can take this type of the research activities forward and make it multicentric. I also heartily welcome our speakers, all four of them who have taken the time out and have, have and, and I'm sure that they are going to contribute immensely to the knowledge and the wisdom of all who are going to attend it. Thanks to one and all who are a part of it. And now I hand it over to Dr. R.S. Trivedi. Sir is uh, the medical superintendent and as Madam has told that he is also the HOD physiology and is also the president of this and without whose support we could not have organized this event. So now I would like to request uh, Dr. R.S. Trivedi to talk a little bit about his input about this webinar. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Good afternoon to everyone. Uh, I, uh, on the behalf of APPI, I congratulate the organizing committee and uh, that is the de Department of Physiology and Department of Pharmacology under the under the of APPI. I am, I am very much happy that uh, MC is in Rajkot. Why? Because uh, I have seen in last one year that the AIMS, especially the Department of Physiology and Pharmacology, under the under the heading of APPI, they are doing something. Something means they are doing the organizing the scientific committee. They are organizing the webinar, and 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 they are the under the uh, under the heading of APPI. So so we are getting the food. We are getting the scientific food, and and uh, and and this is very much essential for updating our knowledge because we are in medical science, and and updation is very very important. I, I I congratulate all the organizing committee and 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 I I also congratulate all the uh, speakers especially their speakers I have seen that their names they are they are very much learned they are very much experienced and and they will deliver a very very good thing I I hope so and and again I um, again I am telling that uh, Ems is in our campus or we are we are together here. So, so PD hospital and in between PD hospital and this uh, EMS, especially we, I am also, I am in from the department of physiology. So, so department of physiology and pharmacology, as well as the PDU, they are, they are doing so, so much things today. Today it is the, it is the webinar and the webinar topic is body, body composition and exercise and, uh, and update on physiological and pharmacological basis. And why, why this uh, topic, Dr. Vivek Sarma has already told that it in, in, in this COVID area, era, what, what we have uh, got in two years, in, in addition to all these things, we have also got the weight. <laughs> so because, because of our sedentary lifestyle, we are, in, we are in lockdown period, we are in all these things. So, so I again, I, I congratulate all uh, this organizing committee 
they are doing uh, i think that uh, interval of 3 months 4 months they are doing <laughs> webinar and all these scientific activities again i congratulate this uh, organizing committee department of physiology department of pharmacology all the ms and all the speakers thank you so much thank you so much sir for your kind words thank you so much sir for your kind words now i would like to invite dr dimple mehta who is senior pharmacologist having more than 20 years of experience in the field madam has also worked as dean of ciusha medical college for the year 2017 to 20 she is also a fellow in medical education and working as a coordinator of meu as well as she has special interest in the field of medical education pharmacovigilance and clinical pharmacology she is also active member of appi and working nicely as an executive member. I invite the madam to say a few words for this webinar. Ma'am, please. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Reema. And uh, first of all, I would like to congratulate and thank you all of you uh, for organizing such a important and such a nice uh, webinar. Uh, is it audible, Reema? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So, uh, yeah because the voice quality was a little bit uh, crackling sound was heard. Okay, so uh, let me congratulate first of all for the to the Department of Physiology and Pharmacology for organizing such a beautiful uh, webinar. I would say it's, it's the, you can say it's a need of the hour. Uh, we know that uh, because of our sedentary lifestyle, the level of exercising and everything is little bit deteriorated in nowadays uh, everyone's life. So this is the, I can say it's the need of the hour. So uh, we know that the, our body is composed of many uh, heavily impacted by what we eat and how we exercise. And our body is composed by mainly our muscle mass and body fat should be uh, considered as the storehouse of energy, but due to our li sedentary lifestyle, it becomes <laughs> storehouse of diseases as well. So this is a very good topic you have taken up and uh, exercise will increase the energy expenditure and to decrease, it will help to decrease the fat indices of our body and that will again help to reduce our webinar, webinar. that will help to reduce uh, diseases in our lifestyle. So congratulations. Thank you very much for making me part of this webinar and uh, I wish you all the best for future uh, CMEs as well. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ames Rajput. Thank you, Department of Physiology and Pharmacology and Long Live Association of uh, Pharmacologists and Physiologists of India. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, madam. So, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, I would like to introduce our today's uh, session speaker, Dr. Pradeep Bardeshar. The sir is a scientific advisor of today's webinar and currently working as an associate professor in the Department of Physiology, Rajkot Ames. Sir pursued his post graduation from Delhi Ames. Uh, sir pursued his post graduation from Delhi Ames with the best uh, postgraduates of the Physiology Award of the BK Anand. And currently, uh, sir was awarded with the uh, uh, Lokamath Prerna Award. Sir is very keen interest in the academic as well as the research and sir is involved into the cardiovascular system, autonomic function and uh, impedance cardiology and the spe uh, speech, uh, sleep physiology. Sir has the international patents about the medical device that is utilized for the critical care and uh, there are so many publications related to it. And sir, currently involved into the extramural project that is on the effectiveness of the mind-body relaxation on the COVID-19, as well as the medical education of technology. So it's a pleasure to hear from you, sir. I welcome you to start today's first session, the introduction of the body composition. Welcome, sir. Good afternoon, all. Good afternoon, all. Uh, so very first, session, that understanding uh, basic concept and uh, its relation with today's topic, that is body uh, composition and its role in exercise and related aspect, including its pharmacological aspect. 
so if we see we all change interestingly so uh, with the age our body composition changes in both the genders um, okay fine five seconds okay. so uh, if you see uh, from our early 20s to the late 60s and later on in both the genders our whole appearance changes and uh, to everybody what matters more is the external appearance that you see that how uh, the uh, body composition in layman's term uh, or uh, for that matter who are not very uh, very much detailed into the field of body composition and how you looks and uh, where is how is the overall anthropometric structure of the person so this body composition required to be healthy and when we say it required to be healthy uh, and when it is healthy we are generally feel good in a larger sense we are efficient in doing our activities we feel better and also uh, the chances remote chances of uh, various diseases are less certain amount of fat is definitely needed it is not always that fat is bad when you when we see uh, a person with uh, body composition with mesomorphic type we'll see what is mesomorphy later on so mainly uh, the endomorphic type sorry so the we'll see what is it later on so in that sense the fat is not always bad component that we have uh, that i state in from the beginning because essential fat is a component in both the genders little higher around 12% in females and around 3% in male so uh, little higher in female gender it's essential to maintain normal physiological activity with this yes the central obesity particularly ectopic fat accumulation are uh, major contributors to the metabolic diseases and uh, various syndromes arising out of that we as a sedentary person most of us are not very keen about doing exercise and love to eat food so in that sense sedentary people like us may gain fat and lose muscle without any noticeable change in our weight if we continue the same practice for a long period of time we feel our weight is same but what we need to understand that just knowing the scale and having the weight on on the scale and knowing that my weight is constant since I, since i was in my college my weight has not been changed so it it may may not be true in when we say the distribution of weight in terms of fat and lean mass so the we may gain fat and lose muscle without any notice in our overall weight conversely the person who is doing exercise again may feel here i'm doing the exercise but there is no, why why this is happening that there may be a gain in muscle mass with simultaneously loss in fat so when we say bmi it correlate with definitely fat accumulation and metabolic health in large population and it is very easy to do and followed wherever you go when you uh, talk about uh, classifying somebody one is overweight one is obese one is um, severely obese so in that it is widely used parameter but definitely it is very insensitive parameter to the actual distribution of body fat so why i am saying this so there is a, um, a concept called as uh, thin fat indian most of you may be aware but it is a very nice uh, thing to know that uh, this uh, diagram shows authors of a paper which tells this uh, to told this concept uh, first to the world and they uh, uh, have little re bit regrets that this image has been used so many times when you it comes to a body composition that they feel the author in one of his narratives he mentioned that they failed to patent it because it has been used so many times that this uh, gentleman on the left side is rudkin and on the right side is uh, yagnik dr yagnik both are working in the same field and what you see they have equal bmi 22.3 and if you see their phenotype appearance it feels that uh, dr yagnik is having 
less body fat must be having less body fat as compared to the other person but when they did the digital analysis what they could see that for equal bmi dr yagnik the person who apparently looked thin had a greater amount of body fat distribution as compared to the visceral fat in that sense uh, as compared to the dr rodkin so just knowing bmi or knowing our weight on a scale or just external appearance may be deceiving when we want to know somebody's body composition and concerning today's topic definitely when we want to study uh, or start any exercise program or effect of that exercise program or want to make certain dietary changes and we want to have some certain long term medication to our patients or to ourselves we need to know the uh, our body composition in larger sense and we need to not just to know once but we need to periodically monitor it when we say body fat body fat and uh, the adipose tissue and the triglyceride we have to understand that yes adipose tissue contains 80% of fat but 20% is other stuff so when we say triglyceride and adipose tissue they are not synonymous in larger sense large amount of visceral adipose tissue so why i am saying this visceral adipose tissue because again uh, over a period of last few decades a large amount of research has occurred and now we are focusing from macroscopic and global distribution of fat within the body what we look from outside or what we look from the inside that is within the body and that to the, around the visceral organs so what has been seen that rather than the overall body fat the visceral body fat and the fat deposition in various visceral organ that is linked to the various cardiovascular illnesses diabetes is one of the more important most important disease of this era liver disease and cancer as well and recently we have uh, started doing the epicardial fat that is present and it has over the heart tissue and that uh, is uh, related again to the cardiovascular risk and a lot of research is occurring in that area also now particular to the exercise in uh, in association with exercise increased muscle fat again is associated with increased insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes mellitus so this uh, tells us about we have to understand about the metabolic balance on one side we have energy consuming muscles and on other side we have the energy storing fat that is adipose tissue so it is the balance between the these two entities that uh, we have to uh, consider when we think about the normal body composition and balance between these two key important compartments now when we say body compartment when we talk about body composition so these body compartment models are different type the most basic one is just we consider body as a single entity and we calculate the body mass that is body weight then second next popular model is two compartment model which where we uh, most popularly use in various studies the fat mass and the fat pre mass which include the lean body mass so that is two compartment model then comes the three compartment model which add the mineral content specifically in the bones and the other areas of the body so this three compartment model is uh, there to understand the body composition then later comes the total body water in addition to the metabolic tissue as a fourth compartment and then now we are going to the cellular level uh in terms of multi compartment model these all models have their advantages and limitations in terms of their feasibility the equipment and resources required for them the assumptions and calculation required when you measure the various uh variables within these compartments so they uh, they have their own uh advantages and limitations and these uh, models uh based on the most popular one that uh that started uh, the research of body composition analysis this two compartment model uh, so the two important things that you can see here is uh, it uh, 
differentiate the fat mass and fat free mass having different density. So it assumes that with the water content of 73.72%. So when assumption is there, it may be variable according to the different body types and it will be associated with errors due to the validity of assumption. Techniques may be very accurate. The techniques that seen in the uh, slide that is on one side we have hydro density meter that is under water body weight measurement or body mass measurement and other is the pod pod that is air displacement method that is air displacement plethysmography the age old technique to measure the these two compartment that is fat mass and heart peak mass so these two uh, techniques are accurate but in terms of uh, errors because of this assumption there are challenges and there have been researches showing the error in the actual measurement of the mass and the uh, fat mass and fat free mass for that matter then next is uh, the three compartment model and the uh, x-ray is the great tool in that dexa scan so dual energy x-ray absorption metry so that where the third compartment that is mineral compartment come into picture and this uh, technology help us to measure that and that include uh, the uh, lean uh, tissue mass and bone mineral content and definitely you have to uh, use two three techniques uh, when we move from two compartment to three or four compartment to finally get uh, the the actual values or the output values of these all compartment that is what is their contribution so we can actually uh, the dexa scan again is the next level but again it comes to its availability and feasibility and the uh, at the cost of radiation exposure so it have its own again uh, issues but yes Apart from that, there are uh, various uh, other uh, techniques uh, like uh, whole body counting, magnetic resonance, and CT scan. These are another two techniques. Again, CT scan is based on X-ray and MRI. Again, it is a non-invasive technique, but again, costly and uh, resource availability. But uh, thanks to the uh, further uh, development in the uh, what do you say uh, technological advances in the MRI. So we have quantitative MRI magnetic resonance imaging, which tells us about uh, to move from measurement of just total body fat to the regional fat distribution, regional adipose tissue distribution in the visceral organs and uh, associated risk factor with that regional fat distribution. When it comes to the feasibility and easy availability, the highlighted techniques are most commonly used in current scenario, that is bio impedance analysis which uh, 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 based on the principle of simple Ohm's law V is equal to IR where instead of uh, resistance we call it as impedance because when it comes to a live tissue it has both capacitance and resistance and combination become impedance so it passes a known amount of electric, electrical current in the body assuming uh, body in a various segments uh, in the form of cylinders that four limbs and trunk so five segment and it send a known quantity of current and then assess it and based upon the frequencies used, this body impedance analysis machine varies. So you have a very simple tool available in the gyms, uh, various gyms and the sport facilities, and it may be very inaccurate to the very accurate based on its uh, technology that is being used. So yes, uh, it is popular because it is easy to use, non-invasive, and no further maintenance cost once you have it. But yes, it also have its own inaccuracies again because of the dynamic variation in the water content of the body and the different body types. So for monitoring, it is good tool, I feel. But when it comes to the actual estimation of this uh, various components of body composition, yes, we have to depend on the, uh, the techniques that are mentioned above. Apart from that, the in vivo neutron activation, again, it, it is a highly uh, resource based uh, technique require large amount of setup and three dimensional photonic scanners. These are the few uh, recent one which are used for the body composition analysis. Last but not the least, that is anthropometry. Very age old technique started from uh, simple measurement of body weight to the measurement of girths and circumferences of various uh, body areas, including arm and the calf circumferences. Uh, then in addition to that, various skin fold estimation, bone girth measurement. So all these are taken into the anthropometry and yes, again, it is a operator dependent tool, high amount of uh, skill set is required to accurately measure this measurement. 
and uh, we have international society of kinanthropometry which basically uh, certify uh, the individuals to uh, take the accurate measurement and we learn from them and we follow their standards when we do the anthropometric measurement but yes it again help us to measure the body fat percentage and not the regional uh, fat distribution in actual sense so in that uh, if you see the body fat percentages uh, based on the calculation from the various skin fold that is bicep tricep subscapular and suprailiac so in that uh, this uh, four skin fold we first calculate bone density by using dernin equation and based on the siri equation then we calculate the body fat percentage i am not going into detail of those equation but here these are the uh, the uh, percentages uh, given for the healthy men and women uh, in different categories uh, to the from healthy to the obese uh, uh, type of uh, in both the genders so if you say essential fat as i said in uh, women and men uh, it is uh, little higher on women then in athletes uh, in male and female athletes again little higher and then if fit people if you see uh, 21 to 24% to the uh, in men it is 14 to 17% and obese more than 32% in the women and more than 26% in the men so these are uh, the uh, percentages uh, again given by the american council of exercise uh, for the as a normal body fat percentages now when we say fat free mass uh, fat free mass is uh, nothing but it is body mass divided of all chemically extractable fat so this is just an example of calculation if somebody's body weight is 75 and body fat percentage calculated by the earlier methods whatever method we have discussed we if we get a body fat percentage it is 23% so the fat mass will be the body mass based on the percentage of body fat and then from from that we can calculate the fat free mass that is body mass Uh, minus the fat mass. So in this case, uh, the person who has weight of 75 kg and percentage 23 percent, it is around 57 kg. That's why we that's how we calculate the uh, fat mass. Now another concept we need to understand when we talk about the uh, body composition is somatotyping. So somatotyping uh, is a very interesting concept in terms of uh, the who gave it. So it initially started with the psychiatry. Uh, the sheldon uh, somatotype and uh, first we will discuss it biological significance uh, in terms of body composition that it it is it is based on the uh, type of three types main three types that is endomorph viscerotonic uh, mesomorph somatotonic and ectomorph or cerebrotonic so if you see the shape of the uh, endomorphs they are plump uh, boxum uh, develop visceral structure and then if you see the mesomorph they are mainly muscular and then if you see the ectomorph they are lean thin and delicate with the poor muscle uh, development and it is expressed as a three number uh, entity if you can see pure endomorph is 711 pure mesomorph is 171 and the pure ectomorph is 117 okay. uh, so that's how we um, uh, uh, help the Uh, identify phenotypically what category the person is and uh, what is interesting in the somatotype as i said it started with the uh, area in the psychiatry by the sheldon uh, uh, they he what he has done is body with the certain psychological characteristic and it was linked to the criminal uh, uh, criminology further so that was heavily challenged and uh, heavily uh, you can say criticized uh, and uh, that is not our area of discussion for today's uh, topic so we'll not delve into it but just for the knowledge uh, but the uh, one part that is the other part that is the body phenotype in terms of endomorphy mesomorphy and ectomorphy is being used till date in this a part of our syllabus of various source uh, courses in india also including upsc so this somatotyping uh, is uh, further um, got development and heath and carter were the assistant of the sheldon who helped him for the initial development of the uh, somatotyping and they further uh, improvised the formula and gave this formula for uh, classifying body in various somatotypes 
and uh, it is major based on the measurement of uh, this uh, all parameters the input parameters are weight height and various circumferences and various skin fold thickness and bone girth so again uh, we'll skip the detailed calculation of each parameter but all these parameter that is endomorphy mesomorphy and ectomorphy are calculated and based on this person's somatotype is calculated and these are being widely used in the current research areas in the field of body composition now how lean is too lean in terms of body type that if you see in the males the lower limb limit of leanness is about 3% and specifically such type of leanness may be seen in long distance runner and it has its own ergonomic uh, advantage uh, in terms of physiology as well body physiology as well so efficient heat dissipation during intense prolonged aerobic activity is affected uh, when we have the uh, more than required amount of body fat similarly in female yes uh, definitely they have more uh, uh, lean fat mass as compared to male so again as we have seen in the previous slide that those female who really appear skinny may not be having really may not be having low body fat content so why uh, it is related to more important to the exercise my next speaker definitely deal more into it so if you see there is one study which shows association between different type of uh, exercises and body composition it was the observational study in 348 individuals and what they saw is exercise uh, in increase lean mass in the normal fat participant and reduced fat mass in the over fat and obese adults and adult with excess body fat may benefit particularly from the resistant exercise now there is another study where uh, it was a randomized control trial in 119 subjects with uh, three groups that is aerobic training resistive type training and in combination of both so what we see uh, it's a differential effect depending upon the type of uh, training used in this uh, uh, graphs so the body fat percentage uh, uh, and uh, weight change is seen uh, in resist, uh, resistant type of training in case of uh, lean body mass in resistant type of training lean body mass increased in aerobic training in fact it decreased and combination of that it is increased weight circumference uh, weight circumference definitely decrease in all type of training and similarly uh, the variable results are seen uh, in the uh, thigh muscle uh, thigh muscle and the uh, the uh, uh, fat mass change so proportion of lean mass loss during caloric restriction is greater than the amount regained this is very very important uh, i want to highlight to all audience uh, uh, first thing that is observed by the any person who is who feel that he or she need to lose weight is the caloric restriction and what happened during caloric restriction is the loss in lean body mass uh, and that loss when you actually uh, stop the caloric restriction and start eating again and what happened that you first gain the fat mass rather than the lean body mass and that is further a vicious cycle set in and that is not uh, the good way to do it so what is good way to do it is uh, both aerobic and resistance training exercises and along with dietary changes they are associated with the beneficial effect on visceral adiposity which is again linked to the various illnesses and stronger stronger focus should be changed in the body composition rather than just changing the number on the weighing scale or your body mass index and we need to monitor it that's why the monitoring in body composition is very very important and again what is important is the uh, intensity of and the week and how many week you continue the exercise rather than the total time spent in a day in the exercise so with this uh, i thank you thank you all thank you dr pradeep now we can uh, go to the next session uh, like to invite our uh, member uh, dr siddharth who will introduce our next speaker dr barun sharma Good afternoon, one and all. I am Dr. Siddharth Datta, Assistant Professor in the Department of Pharmacology. Today, I take the pleasure to welcome our next speaker, who is a sports 
and exercise medicine specialist and a medical and clinical physiologist along with phd in medical and clinical biochemistry so hereby i welcome our eminent speaker dr h barun sharma who is currently placed as a, in charge of sports exercise medicine and sciences performance environmental functional and lifestyle medicine lab and an assistant professor in the department of physiology ims bhu varanasi he he did his sports medicine from netaji subhas national institute of sports patiala he has been associated as a senior resident with the premier institutes like mams and aims new delhi he has served as sports medicine specialist at sports authority of india nerc imphal he has served as guest faculty and external examiner of sports medicine and physiology national sports university imphal he is currently the president of indian society of sports and exercise medicine and a proponent and practitioner of sports and exercise medicine intervention and clinic clinical physiology and functional lifestyle and fitness medicine he has numerous national and international publications to his name and also an active reviewer and editors in many reputed journals he has been awarded with devraj bajaj research award in 2021 by appi and is a topper of basic course of biomedical research in 2020 apart from his illustrious academic and research career to his name he is also a martial art practitioner a black belt in taekwondo and uh, he also is a practitioner of tangta which is a traditional manipuri martial art so we would not find a better scholar to speak on this topic we are delighted to have you on board sir and i hereby welcome you sir to enlighten enlighten us with the topic uh uh hello sir, yes dr varun we can hear you yes okay sir uh, there seems to be problem technical uh, issue is there let me check i have joined uh, using a different id sir actually one of my A laptop is having some current issue, so I have recently uh, just now I have sent the PPT uh, to Dr. Vinay. So, uh, yeah, we can we can project a PPT from here. That's okay. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Yes. No. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Yeah, yeah. Let so, uh, at okay. the time we can have the PPT ready. Yes, mm -hmm. sir. Yes, sir. Uh, so can, thank you very you much, on, sir. On the video, and you can just uh, begin okay, the. Sir. Yes, yes, yes just sir. Uh, sir, can you? Uh, Let me try to share the PPT, sir. Yes, yes. Can you please ask for the team, okay? Just try, try to share. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Will it be able to? Uh, yes, yes, we can see it. Okay, is the slide changing, sir, or not? You can be in a link. Can ask for the team. Sir, uh, the slide is changing or not? No, we are. It is in the. It is not in the slide show mode. Okay, okay. Then th this is a technical issue which I am uh, telling you, sir. Uh, so I have just uh, sent the PPT. It has to be shown from your side, sir. Yes, that will be better. That will be better, sir. Because uh, okay. we will try to project it yeah. from here only. Absolutely, fine, sir. Fine, sir. So uh, without uh, wasting much time, uh, let me. Uh, I mean, I am very grateful, sir, to uh, for inviting me in this uh, session, ex ex excellent session, and I am very much thankful uh, to Sharma sir, Professor Sharma sir, and Professor uh, uh, Rajesh sir also, and uh, our Dr. Pradeep sir, and Dr. Vinay and other my colleagues are there. So, because of few technical problem, we are not uh, able to uh, start. Uh, so. Um, i'm just waiting the ppt from your side sir
Okay, meanwhile, we have a question uh, from Dr. J. Tang related to the encouraging uh, resistive slash weight training for aerobic exercise, considering the fact that per minute spent on resistant training will give one more mileage than aerobic exercise. <laughs> so, uh, if you want to answer that, you can go ahead or otherwise. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, to, yeah. So, can I see the ex uh, where is the Question, in chat, in chat, in chat. Okay, okay, chat, chat person. Yeah, so let me give you a general uh, answer. That is, uh, as far as you can see, body composition, we are mostly focusing on the two compartment model, like uh, Sir has already spoken very nicely regarding different concept of the body composition and a different method. So as far as exercise is concerned, exercise is not the primary main function for reduction of fat, is, uh, fat or body weight. Diet is the most important. Exercise is important for fitness. That is uh, for increasing different component of the fitness and for the maintenance of the weight. So diet, if you neglect the dietary factor, then uh, there will not be any, uh, if you do any kind of exercise, then it will be problem. It will be short term. So in order to have a long term, you have to focus primary number one diet. Number two, exercise for the fitness. For example, if you increase the cardiorespiratory fitness, then it has independent, uh, you know, protective effect of mortality and morbidity irrespective of your body composition so even if you if you are fat then you can be fit and exercise is important for maintenance of the uh, you know the body weight reduction which you have achieved using your dietary uh, you know diet, dietary manipulation dietary intervention and regarding which exercise is more important for body uh, fat reduction then body fat reduction, uh, you know, there are three, four types of exercise. Uh, the most important exercise which we are focusing is the aerobic exercise. And aerobic exercise can be, you know, uh, the, uh, the traditional LSD, the long, slow distance or, uh, you know, low to moderate intensity continuous exercise. Or it can be high intensity interval training. It can be SIT, that is spin interval training and others uh, component. So if you, if you see the expenditure amount of the uh, energy you, you expend during that particular exercise, then low, traditional continuous low moderate exercise is more important. But we already know that the physical activity account only approximately 15 to 30% of our total energy expenditure. So, so we require an exercise which is more important on which increases the RMR or resting, uh, you know, uh, uh, resting uh, metabolic uh, energy expenditure. So in that concept, we focus more on high intensity interval training as well as resistant training. Because in case of high intensity, inter, uh, uh, you know, uh, interval training, what we what we generally uh, uh, what we generally do is we we do uh, you know high intensity interval uh, uh, exercises done at a very high intensity you know uh, accompanied by a recovery period and the important of the ICIIT is ICIIT has a direct effect on you know counter regulatory hormones after the exercise that is and also on the epoch epoch we already know uh, the, the epoch epoch is the oxygen death concept of the oxygen death excess post exercise oxygen consumption which is more important so excess post exercise oxygen consumption is more is uh, you know in case of the hiit and resistant training as compared to you know the traditional uh, aerobic training so if you want to have a long lasting effect then you have to add on hiit high intensity interval training which may have a equal or more beneficial effect in fat reduction as compared to you know the continuous uh, long duration exercise and HIIT, since it, uh, it involves a high intensity, also the anaerobic component, it uh, builds up the muscle also. So it has a more important on the preservation uh, of the lean sector. body mass. Uh, yeah. Huh. So it, it has a more uh, focus on the lean body mass as well as resistant training. So fat reduction, then still we have aerobic, uh, traditional aerobic. But you have to add on HIIT because HIIT requires just less than 50% 50, 50 of the time which you require for the continuous training. So HIIT is effective. But if you want to have a increased lean body mass as well as increase, you know, fat burning throughout the day where you want to increase your RMR, then as well as EPOC, then you have to add on the resistant training. So resistant training, in my point of view, is most neglected but most important component of the exercise training. So, so our, uh, you know, the myth that uh, you have to go slow in treadmill in order to burn fat and all that thing, that fat burning zone, 
the concept of like 55, uh, 55 to 72 percent of VO2 max, you know, that moderate to, uh, you know, uh, 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 moderate intensity of exercise is generally used for uh, oxidation of the fat. The concept of the you know, v, uh, Vmax, Vmax, that is the uh, maximum, uh, you know, fat oxidation uh, rate, uh, which we generally achieve in case of the moderate exercise. And by seeing that concept, many people assume that, uh, you know, in order to uh, burn fat, you have to run on treadmill for a very, uh, you know, at a moderate to low intensity for a longer duration. It is correct for the particular in, uh, duration of the exercise, but the most important is what you have, what your body is doing after the exercise is finished, how you are going to maintain that high energy, uh, you know, expenditure throughout the day. That's why uh, uh, aerobic, uh, uh, apart from the, this aerobic exercise, high intensity and uh, uh, what you call the rest and training is absolutely important. And the combination of these two, uh, uh, this concept, uh, if, if we do this different type of exercise, if we do in the uh, same, uh, uh, what you call uh, session, then it is known as concurrent training. So for fat loss, for preservation of the body, uh, uh, lean body mass, then concurrent training is absolutely important. And, and uh, this should be the approach which we uh, uh, generally uh, follow, which, which we should follow. Uh, if there is any kind of the question, please ask me. Because uh, question wise, also we can discuss while the PPT is being uh, loaded there. Yes, if any question is there, there can be a. Any kind of question, please. Because the PPT is taking time to download. Uh, I think it is a large file, so I think two minutes it will take. So, any one question, if anyone has, you can take. Or, uh, yeah, yes, sir. Chat mm, yes. Uh, question. Okay, there is a challenge when, uh, okay, uh, Dr. Jeevan, we should have patient increasing the fat compartment uh, and we have increasing low, basically. I'm not able to see when we increase. Um, no. it is, uh, can you please read out the questions? Yes, yes, yes. Ah. Uh, when we have patients who have an increase in their fat mm -hmm. compartment and mm -hmm. low muscle mass, basically mm -hmm. sarcopenic obesity, okay, who are mostly resistant, who mm -hmm. would not uh, skeletal muscle shift be a better choice in them? In them, absolutely, absolutely. See. Skeletal muscle mass, uh, you know, preservation is the one of the most important components which we have to focus. That's why resistant training is absolutely important. And sarcopenia and sarcopenic obesity is uh, becoming pandemic, pandemic proportion. And the starting of the, you know, the normal decline of the muscle mass with age start around 35 to 40 years, and it become prominent when you reach the age of the 50 years. So, uh, so, so. If, if, if you don't uh, do a resistant exercise and if you don't preserve your muscle mass, then uh, it will be problem. And we already know that 80 percent, uh, you know, 80 percent uh, uh, of the glucose receptor is already there in the, uh, you know, skeletal muscle. And that's why insulin for insulin sensitivity, as well as countering the effect of the insulin resistance, uh, you know, skeletal muscle mass is important for fat regarding the fat with uh, fat also has a, uh, you know, independent effect and uh, 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 the more important, compo the more important focus is rather on what you call the distribution of the fat, like uh, uh, has already spoken very nicely regarding the visceral obesity, where, where uh, the deposition of the fat is there in the visceral the tissue, central uh, pattern of the obesity, which are more likely to have the, uh, you know, uh, the insulin uh, uh, resistance effect. The most important point which one has to focus is uh, uh, where aerobic exercise is more important until now because uh, different meta-analysis has been done. So from that res uh, result, it, it is uh, seen that uh, uh, since the visceral adipose step, uh, has more, uh, you know, innervation of the, uh, you know, adrenergic innervation is there, they are more sensitive to uh, uh, exercise as compared to diet. So if you only do dietary intervention in case of, uh, you know, if you are targeting that unhealthy part of the obesity, then it will not be effective. Exercise has to be added and resistant exercise and high intensity of the uh, intervention uh, training are, uh, you know, found to be more important as compared to resistant exercise here uh, 
in in this particular population of the fat so if you want to do fat reduction then you have to add on some uh, aerobic exercise it may be you know a traditional a long uh, lsd type of the aerobic exercise or it may can, be uh, a new hiit share? yeah yeah we have we have the powerpoint ready i think we can share it okay 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 sure we'll continue with the rest of the question at the end yeah we will can yeah. take the questions at the end uh next slide please please uh, uh see the 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 most important focus of this slide is i have uh, lots of information is there so my uh, my point is please focus on what i am saying not on uh, you know what is is written on the slide so body composition is a important part of the physical fitness component uh, next slide please and, and and apart from this body composition is just a one of the uh, component one of the component of the physical fitness but there are lots of other component which are more important like it may be cardio respiratory fitness muscular strength and expenditure and all this thing so exercise per se has a relatively less effect on reduction of the body fat uh, uh, or uh, you know body weight as compared to dietary intervention but exercise has a more important focus on different uh, part of the physical fitness which is more uh, which is more important as far as mortality as well as morbidity is concerned next slide please so so if you uh, next slide please ha huh. so we we can see uh, let's focus a relatively about uh, you know different component of uh, the body composition has already been spoken so for practical point of view we will be focusing more on the uh, two compartment model and here you can see that this is just a meta analysis the bmi is not so important what is more important is the you know body composition body composition in the in the form of the fat mass it may be in the form of the percentage body fat is more important as far as mortality morbidity is as much as 30% decrease mortality is important for you know having high or low fat free mass that is lean muscle mass is absolutely important next slide please <clears throat> next slide please so uh, next uh, previous 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 Uh, next slide okay uh, okay uh, so uh, 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 and this is just from our experience uh, you know the different paper we have, we have already published regarding that for example bmi especially if you see a young elite player then bmi is not so useful what is important is always body composition here you can see uh, uh, in this one where uh, you know the player bmi has a component of the lean body mass as well as percentage body fat and that's why the player may be having higher uh, high bmi because of the high lean body mass uh, but low percentage body fat that's why in in case of the player uh, uh, bmi is not useful at all but still uh, it, uh, it, If you see uh, the, the importance of the body composition as far as uh, uh, performance is concerned, it may be aerobic fitness. Like we are, you, you can see that uh, you know the R square, the R square, uh, you know of the uh, VO two max was maximum. Uh, uh, you know, if, if we can consider the percentage body fat as compared to the BMI, as well as if you see, uh, you know, uh, uh, for a no normal individual also, if you see the functional. a uh, fitness in the form of the 6 minute walk test you can see that uh, you know uh, the r square was uh, maximum with the waist hip ra ratio waist hip ratio is just the in the uh, the anthropometric indicator of the centralized uh, the obesity so this shows that uh, you know body composition is more important as uh, as compared to the traditional model like bmi and all, all these things uh, next slide please next slide please so uh, 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 previous previous back huh. so here you you can see that the, like like for example in hockey players we have done this uh, uh, we we have done this uh, vertical jump vertical jump is an indicator of explosive power just mostly it has independent indi indicator for mortality as well as morbidity as well as performance in in case of the player you can see that the skin faultiness by using the you know uh, uh, harpendian skin for caliper we have uh, uh, published the, the, this data it, it was negatively affect uh, with percentage body fat as well as a positive uh, uh, affect with a uh, you know lean body mass as well as here you can see that uh, uh, in case of the uh, of what you call uh, uh, the ball hitting speed the amount of the the, the speed of the ball in case of hockey player it is uh, you know related to the lean body mass that, that's why lean body mass is very much important for uh, performance not only for health but also for performance next slide please Uh, due to less time i, I am just uh, uh, going very quickly next slide please next slide yeah so uh, and 
and also not only for performance but also for health related indicator like for example here in this paper we have published in uh, in case of the diabetic individual you can see that their bmi and body weight is relatively same there are not statistical significant what is important is the indicator of the you know the, the body composition like for example centralized or uh, say, uh, you know uh, obviously like waist circumference where waist waist hip ratio body percentage was uh, more significantly different in case of the diabetic uh, males as well as if you see just uh, if you see the ROC curve in order to predict uh, having high blood sugar, the most important uh, indicator was uh, waist height ratio. That means waist height ratio is mo uh, most important. As also for in case of the hypertetic, uh, hypertensic individual also, uh, uh, you know, th this is the paper which we have also published where uh, uh, apart from the BMI, not the BMI, but the indicator of the waist circumference and waist ratio was found to be more important. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yeah. So coming to the, uh, the intervention of the exercise and the body composition, like I have already told you, exercise is not so important. If you see only and only reduction of the body fat, diet is more important. But still, exercise is important for different, uh, you know, maintenance of the uh, different, uh, the, the fitness uh, uh, the parameter. Uh, please, uh, please, one slide, please. Back, back. Back, back slide. Next, next, uh, next slide, next slide, next slide, uh, back please. Okay, okay, no problem. So, <clears throat> so let's see uh, uh, re re regarding that. The aerobic fitness. Hmm. The aerobic fitness. We have already seen that the aerobic fitness is important for uh, uh, for for maintenance of the body fitness. And and regarding the aerobic fitness, what is important? What is not shown in this slide? Actually, I have uh, inserted that slide, but uh, it is not showing. But the most important one, one which you have to remember, which is uh, becoming famous now, it is is the Mephiton running. And Mephiton running is based upon the principle of LSD, that is fat burning zone. I have already told you that uh, during the exercise mild to moderate intensity exercise there is something known as fat max zone where uh, the rate of the oxidation of fat is maximum it was found to be approximate around 55 to 72 percent of co2 max and by using the carbon and method uh, by using the carbon and method you can easily convert uh, that into a running heart rate so mephiton method is one of the uh, dr mephiton was a uh, you know is a cardiologist. Uh, he, he, he prescribed exercise running, slow exercise running, uh, so that the heart rate, uh, uh, you know, uh, the target heart rate uh, uh, remains around that, uh, you know, maximum uh, uh, fat oxidation zone. Here you can see in this graph that I have plotted this graph using, uh, you know, a maximum heart rate uh, equation one and two. Uh, by Tanaka et al. 2001, uh, and you can see that these are the approximate percentage of the maximum heart rate, uh, depending upon the S, which are required uh, for running. But the problem is, I have already told you that, uh, 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 I have already told you, the importance is, uh, you know, mephiton running may be having, you know, fat uh, oxide, oxide during that exercise, but what about after the exercise? Because after the exercise is more important. The one which is focusing on influencing our resting metabolic rate is more important because activity approximately account only about say 15 to 30 percent of the maximum, uh, you know, uh, daily uh, 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 energy expenditure. That's why the fat loss and the fat mix, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, during the exercise is found to be a myth. And, and therefore, we should be focusing more on higher intensity exercise if your health permit, as well as for rest and training. I've already told you regarding the importance of the exercise on, you know, visceral adipocytes tissue. Visceral adipocytes tissue, white adipocytes tissue, we have already, uh, the, uh, uh, the previous speaker has beautifully spoken on uh, the negative effect. And exercise is so much important. Here yeah, in this graph, you can see that, uh, the, uh, in the y axis you can see this is the changes in the visceral adipocytes uh, tissue per week uh, and and in the x axis you can see it is the volume of the exercise aerobic exercise in terms of MET, mm, MET hour per week uh, so so you can see that it is a negative correlation is there and from from this graph you can see that approximately at uh, you know at 10 MET hour per week is required uh, that volume is required if you want to reduce or or visceral adipocyte uh, tissue. So if you want to reduce your visceral adipocyte tissue, then you have to do exercise, uh, the aerobic exercise, minimum of 10 MET hour per week. That is the which comes uh, uh, the, the approximately to uh, 
uh, say, uh, or 300, uh, you know, a minute of uh, more than 300 minutes of the mild to moderate uh, exercise. Oh my the God. Is, uh, the, the recommended is uh, so around many files. Next, next, please. Next. And here, regarding the ICIIT also, you can see that uh, in case of the ICIIT also, uh, 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 high intensity interval training has a most important point because high intensity interval training majorly affect the resting metabolic rate. Hmm. Yeah. Because uh, there was a, recently one paper was published in, in, in which they, they compared uh, between the different, uh, the, the influence of the different exercise parameter on the resting metabolic uh, rate, as well as the epoch, that is uh, oxygen death or post-exercise or excess post-exercise oxygen consumption. And during that, uh, they found that the rest, resistant exercise was uh, has significantly uh, uh, increased effect on uh, epoch as well as uh, RMR, even after 24, uh, 21 hour after the exercise, not only 12 hour, but 21 hour. So resistant exercise as well as high intensity interval training was also important. But uh, normally, what you call the uh, the uh, the long distance or long slow uh, resistance training uh, uh, the aerobic training what not so important and in this meta analysis you can see that the high intensity uh, interval training uh, has more important not only on the fat mass but also on the effect on the muscle mass so effect on the muscle mass is important and it may be related with counter regulatory hormone like i have all this it may be epinephrine norepinephrine which are more which have a more effect on the visceral Adiposide and, uh, and and this may remain elevated for a longer time. The temperature will be elevated for a longer time after the exercise. That's why HIIT uh, may have a similar or more beneficial effect as compared to your slow, uh, you, you know, resistant, uh, slow aerobic exercise. Aerobic exercise, but the importance of HIIT is it can be done in less than uh, you know half of the time which is required for doing the traditional exercise. So so economy is there. So that, that's why high intensity uh, interval training is absolutely important if you want to target your visceral adiposity as well as maintaining, preserving the effect of the uh, what was uh, the fat free mass. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Hmm. And, and uh, back, back. Yeah. Again, uh, coming to the race and training. Hmm. Coming to the restraint training, the restraint training is uh, like I've already uh, the, the spoken. The restraint training has an important effect on lean body mass because lean body mass is the mass uh, uh, where uh, uh, which is important, which is directly proportional to your daily energy expenditure. So restraint training has a direct effect on lean body mass. That's why restraint training is absolutely important. It is important not only for uh, maintenance of the muscle mass, but also for the reduction of the fat mass. Mm. So uh, the, uh, the normally, you know, the myths uh, among the general, uh, the public is that if you want to uh, do, you know, fat uh, burning, then you, you do, uh, you know, you focus on the slow exercise, aerobic exercise. It is not so. Restraint training has to be adapted. It has to be done. Here in this meta analysis, you can see that the restraint training was gold standard on not only on the lean uh, body mass but also on the fat mass as well as visceral adipocyte tissue hmm, visceral adipocyte tissue and 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 the resistant training uh, the, uh, the the importance another importance of the resistant training is uh, is uh, you know it has a direct effect on countering uh, you know uh, sarcopenic obesity or sarcopenia as well as you know uh, dynapenia dynapenia is the re reduction of the muscle strength uh, with aging and uh, you may be surprised to know uh, to know that the hand grip strength and the single hand grip strength was directly you know re related to, uh, to to the mortality and morbidity risk more than the blood pressure in fact in fact more than the blood pressure that's why strength training as well as the you know muscle mass is very important and re and recently one study they have published uh, uh, regarding the, the ability for single uh, uh, you know stand if you are able to uh, stand uh, you know in single leg just like a flaming or then then your uh, likely, uh, uh, you know, risk of, uh, you know, dying for cardiometabolic illness and morbidity subsequently uh, less as compared to someone who is not able to sit up in a, in a single leg. Um, so that's why resistant training is important. So resistant training has important not only for preservation of muscle mass, but also for reduction of the fat mass as well as, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the visceral adipose tissue, as well as for countering the effect of the sarcopenic obesity. Next slide, please. And another important point which, uh, uh, which we have uh, uh, discussed is uh, 
his rest and training is so much important uh, uh, for uh, uh, for uh, this uh, for uh, you know body composition one may ask that uh, many people may not be able to do uh, you know they, they may not be able to do rest and training as such so 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 is there any alternative for low load rest and training then so that's why the concept of the low load rest and training comes see muscle hypertrophy there are three important component three important reason for muscle hypertrophy the one is the mechanical tension which is absolutely important another is the metabolic tension and the third one is the micro injury micro physiological injury which happens to the muscle during the training so so if you have some injury if your client uh, has some uh, you know musculoskeletal injury or joint problem uh, jo joint problem uh, or, or it is uh, uh, or, or if you are focusing on a elderly population then you uh, may not be uh, uh, or he or she may not be able to do high intensity uh, uh, interval training or traditional re resistance training where at least uh, more than 60 percent uh, 65 to 70 percent of the one uh, repetition maximum weight is required so in that condition, what you can do is you can do what is known as low load resistant training. That is BFR, that is blood flow resistant training. And this blood flow resistant training is absolutely important. Why it is important? Because you can decrease the load. The load can be uh, you know, around, you say, 30% of the 1RM. Hmm, 1RM is the amount of the weight which you are able to lift in only one time by maintaining all the form. So just by 30 to 40% of the 1RM, you can do low load resistant training. But by binding, by having a tourniquet or by restricting your venous outflow, huh? you are maintaining the arterial flow. See uh, here in this video, you, you, you can see that in the aerobic exercise as well as the other exercise, they are using a band, band proximal uh, uh, in the proximal part of the limb. So this band is the, you know, this band, uh, uh, the tightness, the pressure tightness maintained in such a way that they are maintaining, uh, you know, in the, uh, the, the percentage of the arterial occlusion pressure where uh, uh, approximately say 40% uh, of the arterial occlusion pressure, they, they are do, uh, they usually maintain the pain in the upper limb. And by maintaining that the pain, they are doing the exercise. Hmm. For lower limb, it, it's approximately say uh, 70 to 80 percent. So just by manipulating, uh, you know, uh, this basic physiological condition where you are increasing the metabolic tension, you can achieve the same muscle hypertrophy. You can achieve the same muscle strength. You can achieve the increment in the muscle mass, but doing a low load training. So this is this has a special importance uh, for uh, elderly population as well as for different, uh, you know, like ACL reconstruction or musculoskeletal injury. And it, in this uh, forest plot, you, uh, you can see that the BFR, uh, in case of the muscle, uh, you know, uh, 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 increase in muscle mass, uh, they, they, they may have an increment of, say, 0. Uh, 0. 0.4 centimeter square, as well as muscle strength can also be increased. It is not so much, but uh, but if you see the, the population in which we are giving, and it has, it is clinical, it has very much clinical significance. Let's go to the uh, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yeah. So by knowing all this concept, uh, what uh, you you have to do, because see, knowledge is not so important. Inter the application of the knowledge is more important. So physiology, after understanding all the physiological principle, all this concept, the application is more important. Interventional physiology is more important. And for interventional physiology, you have to understand the uh, principle of the exercise prescription. It can be done in the, you know, uh, uh, in the, the format of the uh, fit BP, that is frequency, intensity, time, duration, type, volume uh, of the particular exercise. And this, uh, the, all the exercise has to be uh, 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 concurrent exercise has to be done and that concurrent exercise the frequency you can give uh, frequency like for example if you want to do a traditional uh, aerobic exercise long slow aerobic exercise then you can uh, do you know a minimum of 150 to 300 uh, minute of uh, what you call moderate to vigorous intensity of the exercise per week hmm. and uh, and the frequency you may do most of the time of the week or or if you are able to do then three to six times per week, it is beneficial for uh, uh, maintenance of the optimization of the body composition as well as uh, time duration is uh, 30 to 60 minutes uh, per day. You see, uh, uh, if you are able to do that minimum exercise, if, if you are able to do 15 minutes also high inter interval, inter uh, IIT, high intense interval training, that is also good enough. Most important is doing something. Motion is more important. Hmm. Movement is uh, more important. Then the, the different type of the, you know, uh, the exercise regimen, which uh, you can also focus. 
uh, uh, you know, like uh, for the the volume also, and 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 if you if you go into a little bit technical regarding the rest and training, volume is more important. Volume, uh, what is volume? Volume is the you know combination of the uh, frequency, intensity, and duration. Hmm. The, the the total exercise lot which we give to the muscle that is known as the volume. The volume is more important in case of the rest and training if you are looking purely on the hypertrophy basis. So for rest and training, uh, you you can uh, prescribe the rest and training at least twice a week. Twice a week of uh, you know, say 30 to 40 percent of the uh, 40 minute uh, and six, uh, uh, you know, six different type of exercise uh, focusing on different component, different major muscle. There are six major muscle group of the body you can do. And, and you can, in fact, increase the, the amount of rest and training also by by knowing it's all this uh, 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 all this combination we have uh, applied uh, the, the concept and and we uh, we just have uh, uh, you know in this paper you can see only six weeks of sprint uh, strength and agility training was given hmm. only this much agility uh, train training was given in the high light player the light player see you if you see the light player they, they, they don't have much scope of improvement in body composition they are already at best but in if you if you manipulate uh, or, you know by using all the physiological intervention physiological, physiological principle still we were able to increase you know uh, 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 their lean body mass by decreasing the percentage body weight even though their body weight and bmi was relatively uh, you know same uh, uh, by just by designing a special uh, exercise uh, training uh, for six one say six weeks so this was uh, the paper which we published and it was uh, this uh, the the training regime is continuously used in size post or trip to india where i was working there uh, next slide please next slide please so uh, so with this uh, i uh, uh, previous previous yeah so 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 thank you very much uh, sorry for a technical issue uh, this uh, actually I have sent two slides. This is the first slide uh, which is on. Uh, the second slide is not there. I have lots of material uh, there. No problem. But the thing is, but the principle which I want to convey is physical activity, exercise, and all these things is important for positive physiological adaptation, which is important not only for the health but also for the performance. And here you you can see uh, the, this is the Ernestine Seffert, uh, and she is the oldest Guinness Book of Record, uh, oldest competitive female bodybuilder, seventy four years old. Uh, so you have to choose what uh, you know you 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 want to become. And, and 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 this can happen if you add on resistant training and HIIT if your health permit by consulting a sports exercise physiologist as well as sports medicine doctor, and not only the, the traditional aerobic exercise, huh? and especially when if if you are already thirty five to forty years like myself, so that is extremely important in order to combat you know the cardio metabolic illness as well as the uh, sarcopenia. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Barun. It was a very nice uh, presentation. I think uh, we got much more clarity about the exercise, what type of exercise and what all things we need to take care of during exercise. So one more thing which you highlighted was also important that the diet is equally important if your target is to lose weight. It's not the, just the exercise. So thank you for enlightening us with that. If uh, you, uh, I think we can take one or two questions, uh, we have some time. So uh, in the chat box, if we have any questions, we can just, or uh, maybe one of the participants, if they want to ask, they can also ask the questions. Please feel uh, free to ask anything uh, because the slide which is projected is uh, the incomplete slide. So I have not able to tell a uh, lot of things. We have we had some technical uh, glitches, so but we have Dr. Barun with us, so I think we can take advantage yeah, of that. Sure. If you have any doubt, you can yeah, always somebody uh, please read out the questions. Okay. I'm tired of it. I'm just not making. But that's what the reason is. Yes. Dr. Barun, can you hear me? Uh, yeah. Barun, this is Dr. Jeetan. I think you can type it. Yes, yes. This is Dr. Jeetan. 
Um, now, when we have an older patient, um, can we can we add exercise with oxygen therapy along with the BFR band to improve their uh, exercise capacity as well as improve their skeletal muscle? Oxygen therapy means what? Uh, you that you is, are considering a uh, you are con patient patient or a healthy. And a, a healthy patient, but older, okay, okay. an older oh, patient. So okay. they, but uh, so can we add uh, EWOT that's exercise with with the oxygen therapy plus mm -hmm. BFR, mm -hmm. so that they get a double impact? And is that is that a better choice than just uh, BFR or just EWOT? Yeah, yeah. Uh, see, uh, the concept of the BFR. Why we apply BFR? Uh, one has to understand the physiology. BFR is basically induced in order to uh, uh, decrease the oxygen supply to the muscle. Why? Why? Uh, in order to increase the metabolite. Why we want to increase that? Because if you if you do uh, you know by 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 applying a band on that particular muscle, you are restricting the venous outflow. Hmm. Arterial oxygen is there, but venous outflow is restricted. Then what will happen? Accumulation of the metabolite will happen. Now, this accumulation of the metabolite will slowly lead to the activation of the, you know, group three and four, uh, you know, their that is known as metabolic uh, reflex, which will ultimately lead to the production of the growth factor IGF and all these things. There, therefore, hypo relative hypoxia is required for BFR. And BFR, the concept is in order to uh, increase the, uh, the metabolic tension. So BFR, uh, sometimes the people generally use BFR with hypoxic marks also. Uh, there are some, you know, commercially available hypoxic marks, but they are not so useful. Uh, 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 so in that condition can be used. Another question which you are asking is the, regarding the high, uh, you know, oxygen therapy. So yeah, we, we can do, but it is always advisable to do BFR as a standard alone, uh, 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 not in combination with other, because in if especially if you are doing the elderly population, uh, then uh, the uh, applying BFR in multiple limbs also there may be the cardiac output problem is there. In fact, uh, some of the patients uh, who are not accustomed to the BFR training, they may have cardiogenic, you know, just think up also. And fainting may also happen just, uh, just for that. So that's why a, a, a screening has to be done and BFR, if at all added, then it has to be done at a very low intensity, only alone BFR, huh? like 20 to 30% of the 1RM, like I've spoken. And it can be done a repetition of 15 re repetition. And the rest interval may be, uh, say, less than one uh, minute or 60 uh, seconds per, uh, you know, per set. Uh, and and uh, the occlusion pressure has to be around 50% of the, you know, arterial occlusion pressure. So alone in that concept, we use BFR. Uh, 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 but, but one thing which you have to understand, BFR is for metabolic tension. Metabolic tension is required for lean body mass. But... What about the strength? Hmm. Strength is also important. And strength has an independent predictor for mortality as well as a morbidity in case of the elderly population. But strength is not so affected by BFR. For strength, you have to do traditional training. So traditional training has to be done. If, if the elderly population facing a problem of dynapenia, there is, uh, you know, similar or sarcopenia, where decrease in power and strength is there. So traditional training has to be given apart from BFR. So BFR has to be supplementary, not as a alone therapy. It has to be supplementary, uh, you know, uh, in addition to the traditional training. And on that, you can add oxygen uh, therapy training and all these things, but the scientifically speaking, uh, 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 the combination doesn't yield uh, much, uh, you know, beneficial effect as of now. The, uh, the evidence, the data who said uh, so on. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, Dr. Baron. Baron, yeah. one more question. Yeah, please, um, please. Suppose, suppose you add, suppose you get an older, I'm, I'm, because the challenge are older people, right? So yeah, if you have, yeah, uh, yeah. say, even a, I, th I think even 45, 50 plus, if you have a dynapenia and sarcopenia or sarco, osteosarcodynapenia, you can call that, right? But Absolutely. the challenge, do, do we have good data which shows that BFR also increases satellite cells in the, in the muscles? Absolutely. See, satellite cell, the important of the satellite, satellite cell is a progenitor cell. Everything has to be satellite cell. So satellite cell activation is there by BFR. Uh, BFR, the, uh, see, if you understand the basic uh, physiological mechanism of the BFR, BFR, the increase in lactic acid, the increase in the lactate, the increase in hydrogen ion, the increase in the potassium, the increase in the adenosine. Hmm. 
as well as other metabolites, they activate the satellite cell activity. So satellite, local satellite cell activity is there, and this activity of the satellite cell will increase more hypertrophy. Hmm. And there are, in fact, in some animal study also, they say splitting of the satellite cell can cause hyperplasia also in muscle. Uh, hyperplasia. But that data is not from uh, human. But the important is satellite cell activation is there in BFR. That satellite cell activation where in the muscle where you are using the pen. But the important point of the BFR is BFR has a proximal effect also. Like in the muscle which you are having, apart from the muscle, other muscle where you are not applying any kind of the pen. Still, because of the increased secretion of the growth hormone from the pituitary gland, huh? because of this, uh, uh, you know, three and four uh, 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 nerve uh, uh, exercise reflex, which I have spoken in BFR, they will increase the production of the uh, growth hormone as well as, you know, insulin like growth factor one is also produced. So, growth hormone will increase the activation of the connective tissue, and IGF one will increase the production of the muscle uh, protein, uh, you know. Uh, and that combination is important. Like, uh, you know, the problem of only increasing muscle mass is sometimes what is happening is if you do lots of, you know, high intensity contraction, then there may be a rupture of the muscle may happen or some fraction may happen. This has happened, especially if you do doping with, uh, you know, uh, testosterone, because testosterone doesn't increase much of the connective tissue. But the importance of the BFR here is there is because of the increase in, uh, uh, you know, growth hormone. Growth hormone has a specific effect on connective tissue in increment. So connective tissue increment is there. So BFR will not only increase the, uh, you know, supply cell uh, uh, activation, proliferation. It also uh, increases the production of the growth hormone, which will ultimately increase the production of the connective tissue and insulin-like growth factor, which will increase the, uh, you know, the, the protein component. And hence, ultimately, will lead to the hypertrophy uh, and uh, you know, of that particular muscle. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Baran. Very nice. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, we have one uh, question in the chat box. Yeah, please. So it is when an athlete retires, they become obese. Hmm. So what is more dangerous, doing heavy exercise and retire or maintenance of daily, daily life with minimal resistance training? <laughs> yeah, so let me clarify this thing. Is, yeah, I've already uh, tell you regarding the importance of the diet and exercise. Hmm. See, our body is not a food. If you do lots of energy expenditure, then there may be compensatory mechanism will also be there. Like, for example, if you do lots of exercise, then what will happen after the exercise? That's During the exercise, good. your hunger will be suppressed. But after some time, the hunger may be increased. Hmm. Yeah. So in, if you don't control that intake, if you, if you crave, it if you keep on craving, if you do, the hunger is there, then what will happen? The effect of the the exercise will not be there because the effect of exercise is very minimum if you see only for weight reduction. Hmm. If you see only for weight reduction. So exercise is more for fitness, more for cardiorespiratory fitness, for lean muscle mass and all that stuff. So, so most important is dietary intervention. Like for example, traditionally, scientifically speaking, uh, normally around resistant training plus, uh, you know, five kilocalorie of, uh, uh, per day of energy reduction should be generally prescribed uh, uh, during the exercise uh, intervention. If you do a low caloric diet, that is more uh, less uh, more than uh, 500 kilocalorie, then your lean muscle, muscle mass will be lost, even if you do resistant training also. So, so athletes generally, you know, during the their uh, you know peak uh, performance, they are having very high uh, you know uh, uh, diet uh, because of the requirement of the sports, high caloric diet requirement of the sports. Then just after retiring, they are not able to control uh, you know the dietary intake. But exercise, they are not able to do any kind of exercise also. So ultimately, what will happen? Obesity will be uh, the problem. So what is most important is if you want to have a long-term benefit, then dietary intervention has to be there. Like, for example, uh, if you do, if you add uh, high protein, uh, you know, high high quality protein intake of approximately the, the RDO protein is around 0.8, uh, you know, gram per kg per, per day uh, of intake. But what we uh, uh, prescribe is generally around 1 to 1.6 gram per kg of your lean body mass or your ideal weight if your BMI is more than 30. So protein intake is absolutely important. You cannot compromise uh, that protein. If you continue eating protein, if you continue eating high quality fat, high quality fat, healthy fat, hmm. and if you do reduction of the processed high carb and uh, uh, high carb, high processed food, hmm, which, which impact on your craving and hunger, 
hmm, and negativify, uh, you know, and exclude all that uh, low quality fat like, uh, you know, omega-6. And uh, though PUFA, there is more, mostly omega-6 as well as vegetable oil, then your hunger will be controlled. Hmm. Your hunger can only be controlled by having a high quality fat and high quality protein meal with the less processed fat. So if you combine that with resistant training, even if after you retire, then there will not be any problem of obesity. So obesity is not only for caloric in, caloric out, output. Our, our body is not a physical system. It is a interacting multidimensional, what you call the physiological system where hormones plays an important role. So you have to understand that. So if, if you don't focus on that, then after doing high performance, then, then if you cannot control your hunger, if you cannot control the intake, then obesity will be there. Natural, it cannot be prevented. Yes, thank you. Okay, I think uh, one more last question we can take before we go to the next session. Sure. So mm -hmm. uh, there are many, many questions in the chat, but I think the last one only I will take. There is uh, one question that is, I am a cyclist or plus every day. I believe one two also improves the mitochondria and improve the base fitness level. Mm -hmm. So the question is, is 80% mild exercise and 20% HI, ITN or weight training good idea for overall performance improvement? Yeah, and absolutely. How, mm -hmm. how long, and one more thing, how long it takes to replace old mitochondria with more efficient one? Yeah. See, mitochondria, there are, there are two, three things you have to understand. Mitochondria can be, uh, you know, mitochondria or mitochondrial fitness. You can focus on by different component. The first one, the exercise component. Which type of exercise you require? Mitochondria is for aerobic oxidation. Mm, aerobic oxidation is important for which type of exercise? For aerobic exercise. And which type of aerobic exercise is more important for increase of VO2 max? HIIT. So HIIT is absolutely important for mitochondrial health. But HIIT, since uh, you know uh, HIIT has a component of the high intensity, it is not uh, for everyone. You, you require a particular baseline fitness and baseline fitness has to be there. It has to be built up by slow, uh, gradual, the traditional, uh, you know, uh, like if you're doing cycling, then you can do that. The traditional pattern of uh, cycling, uh, then uh, HIIT can be incorporated uh, on that, like which you are doing, it's fine. Then after that, uh, the, then sometimes uh, if you are, uh, if, I don't know regarding your uh, weight, weight uh, uh, what is your body composition, so I cannot comment. But for obese person who, who are doing exercise, uh, this thing, we also advise for mitophagia, my, you know, the autophagy and mitophagy with intermittent fasting, healthy way of intermittent fasting, we generally include it uh, along with the exercise. If you want to target the mitophagia, that is, uh, you know, if you want to decrease, uh, increase the degradation of the old mitochondria, and regeneration of the new mitochondria. So uh, uh, along with that exercise, we generally prescribe. Also, there are lots of supplementation are, are also required, which are just a supplement uh, uh, for that thing. And, and regarding uh, uh, the add-on of the uh, uh, strength training, strength training is also absolutely important because you, you, you have to, you, strength training will increase the bulk of the muscle. The bulk of the muscle enhance the, you know, uh, the mitochondria and others will also be improved. And the importance of the strength training, see, you have to understand two things regarding strength training and HIIT. HIIT, if you combine traditional aerobic exercise with strength training, then the problem is uh, if you are a bodybuilder, say, uh, if, if you are a, a athlete or if you are a cyclist, which is more focused on a sprint, sprint event, huh? sprint power output, then if you combine the same session in a single session, then, uh, then there may have a negative interference effect. This is known as interference effect. Interference effect is, uh, you know, the, the, the chemical messenger of the, you know, strength training that is M4, huh? uh, uh, M4 pathway, whereas, uh, uh, whereas the chemical messenger for aerobic uh, system that is known as a MPK kinase, the MPK kinase has a negative effect on the M4 pathway. There, therefore, if you are more focused on the power uh, strength or bodybuilder, then uh, traditional aerobic training combining with the, you know, bodybuilding hypertrophic exercise is not a good idea uh, good idea but if you are doing if you are if you are an aerobic uh, you know uh, player then strength training doesn't have any kind of the negative effect and if you want to choose one aerobic exercise which has no negative effect on uh, on this uh, which have relatively less interference effect is hiit and which type of hiit 
cycling. So if you are, since you are already cyclist, so cycling high intensity interval training, uh, you know, combined with the strength training, after a baseline level of the baseline level beloved by your traditional aerobic training, plus if you are overweight, I, uh, 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 what we call the intermittent for healthy intermittent fasting in order to promote the mitophagia, these are the important for your mitochondrial health. Hope it's Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Barun. Yeah. It was Thank a you, very nice session. In spite of technical glitches, I think you had you are successful in transmitting the message which we intended to receive through this CME. So thank you so much. And we look forward to another collaborations in future also. Ames Rajkot will definitely be interested in collaborating in more uh, better way and more advanced way. Thank you. Thank you. So proceed to our next session. I will uh, uh, request Dr. Siddha to introduce our next speaker. Uh, next session, I will like to introduce Dr. Tejas Patel. He is an associate professor currently at All India Institute of Medical Sciences, Gorakhpur. He is a gold medalist in his MD exam conducted in 2010. He has an experience of around 12 years in the academics. Apart from that, he has 68 international and national 16 meta analysis. He has total more than 1400 and I10 index of 27. His areas are pharmacovigilance meta analysis. He has served as a guest faculty on the topics of meta analysis, uh, good clinical practice, pharmacovigilance, ethics in medical research, scientific writing. We are happy to and delighted to have you on board, sir. Uh, kindly enlighten us with, with the topic of drug pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics and body composition. Welcome, sir. Thank you, sir, for the nice introduction. Uh, first, I would like to thank the Dr. Sarma, sir, and Dr. Rima, sir, for giving me this opportunity. Uh, am I audible? I hope yes, I'm sir, audible. Yes, sir, you're audible. Yeah. So today's our session is on the drug pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, and body composition. The saline features of my today's presentation will be will focus on the importance of drug dosing. Initially, while we will understand why it's important from the obvious point of view. Then we'll discuss about pharmacokinetic changes and pharmacodynamics related to the obesity and uh, body weight. Ultimately, we need to choose the doses for our patients. So what are the body weight descriptors available for the selection of doses? So that will be our focus. Start with the basic terminology. What do we mean by pharmacokinetics? It's the science of kinetics of drug absorption, distribution, and elimination. Elimination includes metabolism and excretion. So another terminology involved here is pharmacodynamics, which refers to a relations in between a drug concentration at the site of action and pharmacological response. So what kind of the response? It can be a subtherapeutic response or therapeutic failure, therapeutic effect that we intend, or adverse effects, or a combination of this. Then comes to the body composition. So, so much things have been said about the body composition till now. It's a simple terminology. It's the ratio of fat mass to fat-free mass. A fat mass includes adipose tissue, while fat-free mass includes everything else, closely concerned to the lean body mass, organs, muscles, bones, connective tissue, and water. It has a relatively constant composition in healthy individuals, though there are the certain factors, age, as we discussed, gender, physical activity. We have discussed so much. Uh, illness could affect its composition. Nutritional status. Uh, 
though BMI is in a poor predictor, it cannot uh, differentiate between the high muscle mass and high adipose tissue. Still, the literature about the kinetics and dynamics are rely on this. And uh, BMI more than 30 we used as a cutoff point for the obesity. And uh, more than 40 we considered as an, a morbid obesity. So uh, it's usually used as a cutoff point as a 30 when clinicians should be a cautious while using the while selecting the doses for a person. Obesity is a condition in which excess body fat accumulates such an extent that it may have a negative impact on health. Why drug dosing in is obesity is important. So what we are uh, facing now, increase in obesity prevalence over a period of time in the science, two or three decades. And what we are observing is it's not limited to the developed nations. In even the low and high, um, low and middle income countries are also observing the high prevalence of obesity. According to one estimate, up to 50% of the world's adult population will be either overweight or obese by 2030. And it links with many diseases, hypertension, coronary artery disease, stroke, type 2 diabetes. In fact, the uh, diabetes, association between diabetes and obesity is considered equivalent to tobacco and lung cancer. Several forms of the cancer. And because of this rise in prevalence and it's associated with many comorbidities, it's likely that clinician will encounter obese patients with increasing frequency in their daily practice. So that's why it's important to understand dosing in an obese individual. Another important thing, the all drug doses we used, either fixed doses or based on uh, milligram per kg or dose ranges are based on the clinical trials during the drug development process. But the people with obesity or people with different body compositions, we can say, are usually underrepresented or excluded in clinical trials. And this body size, because of the different compositions of the muscles and uh, fat, we will understand in next couple of minutes, affects the pharmacokinetics and that affects the pharmacodynamic response. So dose and the dosage calculation so many times based on the patient's total body weight is considered often inappropriate. Why it's important? So this is a diagrammatic representation of the approximate distribution of the lean mass and adipose tissue in a normal weight person and obese patients. Though, you know, when obese also, proportionately uh, muscle mass will rise, but there is disproportionate rise of the adipose tissue. Uh, so approximate ratio of the normal weight patients and adipose uh, in normal is a 4 zm ratio, while in obese persons, it's 3 zm to ratio. Now, what are the important pharmacokinetic parameters? They are important, which affects the drug dosing. And the first is the viability, which represents the drug absorption. Volume of distribution, where the drug is going to be distributed. Clearance, which is represented by the metabolism, elimination, metabolism and excretion, and elimination half-life, which are roughly related to the duration of action of drugs. Viability is a fraction of drug that reaches the systemic circulation after non-parenteral administration. So percentage of the drug, percentage of doses which has been available. Usually, the, though the limited research is available, the, which suggests obesity is not likely to much affect the parameters of the viability. But yes, it can definitely affect the non parental administration like subcutaneous, intramuscular, because of the changes into the fat and weight. Another important parameter is we, we consider into the pharmacodynamics is a volume of distribution. It, it's, a, it's again, it's a mathematical equation. It's an apparent volume in the body that contains the drug. It can be calculated by the total amount of the drug in the body 
So concentration of the drug in the given part. So drugs with Dr. Tejas, your voice is not audible. I think you have mute your mic. Yeah, okay, okay, okay. Okay, now audible. Ah, okay. Thank you so much. So, ah, yes, we are on the parameter of volume of distributions. So, drugs with extensive distribution in the body usually have the larger volume of distribution because, of, and those with the uh, limited distribution, is a smaller volume of distribution. That's what I'm explaining. Now, volume of distribution only indicates the extent of distribution. Volume of distribution information alone is insufficient actually to determine the actual size of distribution. That can only be determined by the tissue concentration of a particular drug at the site of the actions. So two drugs may have the same volume of distribution, but one may primarily distribute into the muscles and other could be into the adipose tissue. So absolute value of the volume of distribution has no meaning. That's what I want to convey. Even obese and non-obese individuals may have significantly different plasma concentration, but similar tissue concentration could be possible. This volume of distribution parameters is important for selection of the loading dose, initial dose, you can say. This is important in a situations when parenteral drug administration required and for acute conditions. As we discussed, the parameters which affects the volume of distribution is distribution of the drugs, for example, simply tissue blood flow. So, which is likely to be reduced in obese individuals. The physiological changes in the microvascular system due to obesity, which ultimately affects the tissue blood flow and perfusion. Thereby, thereby it could reduce the tissue blood flow. This could be because of the increased level of oxidative stress and or inflammatory cytokines. A proper, proper tissue penetration is particularly important for the antimicrobials, which are being used for the localized infections or for perioperative prophylaxis. For example, cefuroxine, cephalosporine, ciprofloxacin have shown that tissue penetration in obese patients significantly reduced. This is believed to be because of its effect on the tissue blood flow. Then second important factor is plasma protein binding that we need to understand. So alteration in either concentrations of the plasma protein binds or their binding affinity could affect the movement of the drug because only the free form of the drug usually distributes. If the drug binds to the plasma proteins, either albumin or alpha glycoprotein, usually restricts into the vascular compartments. Obesity can affect, but the, here the albumin usually is not being impacted. What is being observed is alpha-1 acid glycoprotein, which is related with basic drugs, likely to be affected. Even the studies have shown the contradictory findings. Some says it may increase, it may decrease. Other important factors we need to understand for the volume of distribution is physico-chemical attributes of the drug, molecular size, degree of ionization, lipid solubility, and ability to cross biological membranes. Here is the lipid solubility, is important from the body composition point of view. For example, in this figure, this is our A and B represents the lean individuals and obese. Based on the lipid solubility, we have the two kinds of the drugs, either the uh, non-lipophilic or lipophilic drugs, or less lipid soluble or more lipid soluble drugs. 
if a drug is having characteristics of non lipophilic in nature so it doesn't matter whether the person is a lean or obese because it is not going to be excessively distributed into the adipose tissue if the drug is having uh, lipophilic characteristics lipophilic drugs then it is likely to be uh, distributed more into the adipose tissues in an obese individuals so in such conditions the volume of distribution is likely to be affected those who are having a lipophilic property so in lipophilicity may influence the distribution of the drug in obese and there could be a marked increase in the ratio when there is marked increase in the ratio of the adipose tissue to the lean product now highly lipophilic drug molecules may accumulate more in food stores and display a large volume of distributions this is we observed with the dizepam this is also being observed with various tricyclic anti depressions but the lipophilicity is not the absolute parameters the propofol and uh, general anesthetic agents a highly lipophilic drug but does not so increase into the volume of distributions so there are the other factors could also affect uh, so what we can conclude is volume of distribution changes in obese could be drug specific and may be attributed to physical chemical properties of the individual drugs then the another important parameters we considered into the kinetics is the clearance of it which is related to the metabolism or excretion a volume of blood from which drug is completely removed in a given allotted time it depends on the blood flow to the organ of elimination whether usually liver or kidney and the ability of the organ to extract the drug from the blood and clearance in clearance the characteristics of a drug have a little impact the clearance is largely controlled by the physiology of a person physiology of an individuals physiology of the liver physiology of the kidney to be specific and is an essential pharmacokinetic parameters while devising a maintenance dose regime earlier we discussed volume of distribution which is for the loading dose initial dose selection while maintenance while for the chronic conditions which is more important parameter is the clearance a liver is the principal organ mediating the clearance we can a uh, clearance can be presented based on this equation it depends on the hepatic blood flow and the hepatic extraction ratio so ability of the liver to extract the drug now obesity has been linked with the non alcoholic fatty liver diseases so which alters the hepatic blood flow that means it affects the clearance of those drugs which is being metabolized by the liver then increase in cytochrome cyp2 e1 activity with obesity has been observed but the significance of this finding is minimal because the very few drugs which is being metabolized by these enzymes but of drugs which is being uh, conjugated with the glucuronides or sulfation are likely to be affected because total body weight proportional increase in this activity has been observed for example propofol it is extensively metabolized by the glucuronides enzymes and considered having high hepatic extraction into drug so which clearance is increased in obese individuals as compared to non obese individuals other primary organs is the kidney and in kidney glomerular filtration tubular secretions and tubular reabsorption are the important that we can present it with this action this equations the glomerular filtrations largely depends on the unbound form of the drugs and so drug clearance will increase if we increase the glomerular filtrations and tubular secretions while if the reabsorption is more uh, renal excretion will be less obesity is related to a state of glomerular high filter hyperfiltrations and according to estimates gfr could be increased by 60% so drugs which is primarily excreted through glomerular filtration only for example vancomycin its clearance will be its clearance is being observed high in obese as compared to non obese and deltaparin a low molecular weight heparin again its clearance is observed being high as compared to 
none of this because of the increase into the renal blood flow, increase into the kidney size. Then there could be the another group of drugs which could be eliminated by both glomerular filtration as well as tubular secretions. Procainamide, ciprofloxacin, digoxin. Again, the trend towards higher clearance is being observed. And in those uh, participants and patients, the GFR was normal, creatine clearance was normal. So it is mainly believed to be increased into the tubular secretions. So not only GFR, it can also increase the tubular secretions also. Then there could be another group of drugs which whose elimination involves glomerular filtration as well as tubular reabsorption. Lithium, for example, increase in renal clearance again is observed with normal glomerular filtration. So that could be because of the inhibition of the tubular reabsorption in the obesity drugs. So in general, renal clearance of drugs is higher in obese patients, either because of the increased glomerular filtration and tubular secretions. This is well documented. While less published evidence about tubular reabsorption and renal metabolism. And this increased hyperfiltration, hyperperfusion, increase in GFR, what is being observed in obese individuals could be uh, decreased over a period of time as a persistently elevated intraglomerular pressures. And the half life, the fourth parameter. It depends on the volume of distribution as well as clearance. So as we discussed earlier, both are likely to be affected in obesity. So it either changes into the volume of distribution or changes into the clearance. Both could have the impact on the elimination of life. Now, what could be the, whether the obesity can affect the pharmacodynamics of it? So obesity and morbid obesity is not just simply excess weight gain. It's considered as an altered anatomy and physiological state. It has been associated with dysregulation of metabolic homeostasis, dyslipidemia, diabetes, cardiovascular disease. So in various conditions, it is being associated. Largely believed because of the adipose tissue mediated or expressions of TNF-alpha, interleukin-6, various other cytokines. And obesity can or could also lead to the nutritional genetic changes really affects expression of the various receptors. Simple, clear example is diabetes mellitus. The TNF alpha is expressed in excessive amounts in obese patients, which could lead to the insulin resistance. Then adipose tissue can also have a greater insulin claving activity. So more insulin is required to produce the same pharmacodynamic response. It's, it's, it's well known. Then obese patients had worse outcomes with infectious diseases than normal weight patients. Why this happens? Adipocytes secretes leptin, which reduces macrophage and T-cell differentiation and activity, which also affects the <laughs> immune system. <laughs> Then obesity also affects the whole organ system, cardiovascular system. We have the example. Increasing weights leads to the increase in blood volume, subsequent increase in the cardiac output, and baseline heart rate are being observed more. It could lead to the development of the left ventricular hypertrophy, hypertension, or even the long-term effects of the obesity are more likely to be associated with the heart failure also. Not only the cardiovascular system, GI system, respiratory system, various other whole systems are also to be You just discussed the kidney. The renal system is also likely to be affected in obese individuals. Now we will understand with, in fact, with the certain specific examples, because ultimately the pharmacodynamics is important, which is all associated with the response, therapeutic outcomes. So the literature is not consistent about the effect of obesity on the pharmacodynamics. The various uh, diverse findings were there, but more towards increase in volume of distribution and increase in clearance with the beta blockers. But even though these changes has been reported, the pharmacodynamic effects of the beta blockers are same across the different weight groups. 
but we usually don't prefer beta blockers in obesity that is mainly because of the it's linked to the insulin resistance and its effects on the glucose metabolism because these two are very commonly associated now we will understand with this uh, table also there are changes into the systolic blood pressure and on the right side changes in difference into the diastolic blood pressure so we are dealing with the two outcomes we have the two group of the individuals non obese and obese on both sides for the systolic blood pressure and diastolic blood pressure we have the four studies trinity mother blood pressure curves and adrenergic blockers where various and combinations of the anti hypertensive being evaluated if you concentrate on the number two study mother study angiotensin receptor blockers with calcium channel blockers olmesartan and amlodipine so what we observed is more reduction into the systolic blood pressure when more response more anti hypertensive response was being observed in non obese individuals while those who are using the adrenergic blockers alpha and beta blockers what is being observed is more response is being observed into the obese individuals as compared to non obese individuals though the statistical difference was not statistically significant because p was 0.09 but the trend towards more response into more response towards obese individuals but these are the small sample size studies those who are the larger sample size studies the studies number 1 and number 3 here yeah, the trinity and bp cras they don't report the significant differences but still the trend towards uh, more response into the non obese as compared to obese individuals so obese individuals are general uh, trend of more resistance to for the response of hypertension anti hypertensive drugs in general that can be observed the similar findings were also been there for the diastolic blood pressure then the anti diabetic drugs newer insulin analogs insulin respro after administration of the 10 units uh, c max per dose was 41% lower in the obese as compared to non obese individuals or healthy individuals we can say so it only indicates either slow absorption because of the subcutaneous facts or there is an action to the insulin resistance but that is not consistent across the different insulin analogs and those studies are also having the small sample size the biphasic insulin preparations so plain insulin plus its component with the nph insulins there was no significant difference in the fasting blood sugar levels after administration into the non obese and obese so response was the same so we understand that till now the pharmacokinetics could be affected into the obese individuals and pharmacodynamics could be could have been affected but it could be a, it, it is more likely to be a drug specifics and those studies are usually affected by the small sample size what we have been observed so now another important dilemma for the selection of the doses actually in a clinical practices how to decide the doses into the obese patients we have the various weight descriptors total body weight bmi body surface area ideal body weight adjusted body weight lean body weight or predicted normal weight a total body weight usually assumes that the drug doses are linearly scalable across the different weights so it simply assumes that a patient of 170 150 kg is as double of the 75 kg so there is a risk of toxicity in obese patients it is is easy to understand but this so what we do to prevent is arbitrarily there is a capping of the dose that maximum 1 gram maximum 2 gram we, we cap the doses but they are usually arbitrarily not based on a clinical trials so there is always a risk of sub therapeutic exposure and possibility of the treatment failure in the obese individuals so to overcome this various uh, body weight descriptors has been suggested has been evaluated into the treatment for example bmi but again it is not a reliable most of the researchers believe now that it do not differentiate actually in between the high muscle mass and high fat mass so it is only for the classifying the obesity 
the body surface area yes it is being used for the anti cancer drugs it, it takes into account the total body weight and height of the individuals but it do not account the gender the lean body weight it all mainly measures the fat free mass fat free mass and the second equation which is based on the body impedance analysis it, it, it is is a pretty reliable it do not deviates at the extremes of the height and weight the ideal body weight again the limitation is it only assumes the same sex and same height would receive the same dose irrespective of the body uh, composition adjusted body weight only limited to the use of the amino glycosides uh, sorry uh, that is ideal body weight is calculated and we adjust it with the 40% to accommodate the adipose tissue another is predicted normal weight again is unreliable at the extremes of the height and weight so if we apply all these formulas if the person is having 150 kg weight and who is 170 cm tall total body weight is 150 kg we get lean body weight of 80 kg ideal body weight of 65 kg so obviously large variations exist for the milligram per kg dosing depending on which metric we used and yes we require a clinical trials or research based on the body weight descriptors to define the dosing so in conclusion obesity can alter kinetics and dynamics of some drugs alteration depend greatly on the drug class and agent being studied estimating the optimal dose for the obese patients is difficult and many cases it's still defined and need to perform drug specific studies preferably at the time of the drug development to clarify if those alterations are required in obese patients some of the learning resources are gone through thank you thank you dr tejas for very nice presentation mm -hmm. and uh, if the time permits we can take one or two questions there are few questions in the chat box of which i am uh, just reading out one or two does propofol dose require changes in obese patients based upon your finding related to clearance of a drug yes clearance is more again it is it's an ill defined for the propofol but what i can say the second question does alter pkpd of drugs in obese patient translate into the dose changes yes so there are the, uh, there are the attempts has been made for the low molecular weight heparins actually for the 1 mg per kg bd it could be converted into the lean body weight 1.5 mg per kg bd this being done okay thank you so much dr tejas the session is i hope very hopeful very helpful for all of us now we request our next speaker i would like to invite dr naresh to introduce our next speaker for the session good evening everyone i am myself dr naresh parmar assistant professor in department of physiology it's my pleasure to introduce uh, the well known personality that is dr ravindra sukla welcome dr ravindra sir uh, he is a renowned endocrinologist and uh, working as a associate professor in department of uh, endocrinology and metabolism at aims jodhpur in fact uh, he has started the department of endocrinology at aims jodhpur which was the second largest department in the rajasthan uh, he has a uh, very lots of uh, experience in uh, medical field and during this tenure he has consulted more than 30000 opd endocrine patients as well as treated uh, more than 5000 uh, ipd patients uh, he received the many medals but uh, i want to mention he won the gold medal in dm endocrinology exam and he is having the very vast experience in uh, research field 
uh, one of them i want to mention is a uh, completed the fellowship in basic and clinical aspects of eyelid transplant in uh, world's largest eyelid transplant at edmonto canada and uh, other than these things uh, sir is uh, interested in the uh, many languages uh, he can fluent in uh, speaking the hindi english gujarati and uh, marathi and can understand uh, a lot of language so welcome sir okay uh, thank you for kind That's only thing was i cannot uh, speak gujarati marathi sanskrit do second but not gujarati so that was the correction okay so um, uh, if for uh, your with your permission i'll share my screen yes is my screen visible yes sir yes sir okay so the topic given to me was drug therapy for obesity and recent advances uh now uh, always whenever there is a lecture on anti uh, obesity drug there is always you know a new recent drug and that drug gets banned after some some you know years this has been the the history of anti obesity drugs from at least like uh, 30 years or so 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 i just uh, i just start with the problem statement that uh, in india because uh, we have a pandemic of obesity and indians are uh, obese even at lower bmi which is what we call the thin fat indians and uh, it mostly starts with birth they throw birth with babies they become obese and apart from that uh, there are these lifestyle factors a lot of time discussion of obesity is about lifestyle intervention lifestyle factors in this uh, you know, presentation letter on alco why uh, lifestyle intervention is is not does not work and will take a back seat in future the seems to have been the changes modifications why i'm talking about this is because these epigenetic modifications they make our brain tuned to become obese always you know so it's not that ki i was uh, earlier i was you know uh, lean and then i became obese a lot of obese patients have are obese because when they uh, were born or you know during the perinatal period the epigenetic modification that led them to the obesity so it was already kind of decided when for example they were 4 years of age or 3 years of age that how shall become obese so so this is a problem and we have a um, lot of drugs uh, 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 pharmacotherapy now on which my uh, lecture would be uh, uh, would be focused on but we should not let me uh, give kind of a uh, uh, reminder that still anti obesity therapy is based on lifestyle intervention which is about physical activity and the third part is after injecting is behavioral therapy you know be, how does one thinks and how does one handles stress uh, uh, otherwise by eating most of the time the most natural response to any stressors would be to seek more calories which is a very normal normal response so that's all why uh, uh, like a change lifestyle and even if you know uh, lifestyle would not have been changed just because of calories are available <laughs> oh. So, so, so the, the the availability of calories itself is fueling the pandemic of obesity. You cannot by just doing physical activity, by doing running and joining a cycle club or doing yoga, you cannot prevent that. The, we have an evidence, epidemiological evidence. The food is cheap. It's much cheaper than it was, for example, hundred years back. I'm not talking about the ten years back, five years back, but over the period of time, in hundred years, it has become available and cheap. also the calories have become available all time earlier one had to cook and then the calories would be available now they are available with uh, you know with fast foods now so uh, now i come over to the treatment normally whenever we start on drugs and there is a phase when somebody loses weight and this always happens in the six months in six months i can tell which patient is going to lose how much and whether is going like 90% of patients will be using weight do the drugs properly and the lifestyle properly so in 6 month we that will be decided how much they will lose over the period of time how much they will benefit a lot of them after you know losing weight also they might not be benefited hypertension so so i call it like 3 to 6 months i call it kind of a period when uh, the rest of we get to know how the pathway will be 
Then this is what we call the weight loss and the maintenance of weight loss. Somebody has lost 8, 10 kg. Even if somebody has lost 5 kg, that is legally significant. 5 kg. A lot of time weight loss is equated with cosmetic, like whether I'm looking good or uh, that's the thing, whether I'm looking fit or something. But as a, as a clinician, as an endocrinologist, I see weight loss. How much weight loss will lead to meaningful uh, improvement in blood pressure, meaningful improvement in blood glucose, and in, in the longevity. So, 5 to 6 kg any, for anybody, even 100 kg or 70 kg, so is what is baseline, this is okay. This kind of will provide them uh, good uh, metabolic benefits. But a lot of time, novice patients, they are looking for a weight loss of 20 kg or something. So, that's, that's why we need drugs and we need uh, still whatever drugs are available, uh, uh, we need more of that. These are treatment options at the right hand side is gastric bypass. Now, the bypass surgery in 2022 is not a preferred option. We have a lot of drugs, we have a lot of evidence how to treat it. A lot of patients who would otherwise end up with surgery, I think we can uh, make them lose weight without going through the bypass surgery is for a very minimum, probably uh, point should be given to like 0.1 to 0.2 percent, not from one percent to the base patients. But this is, I take some time on this slide uh, because this uh, shows what are the drug targets. Uh, and this is not from a purely pharmacological point of view. This is from the way we, um, as, a, as a clinician, we see. So I start with the brain. Uh, brain is now obesity is a brain disease. And uh, and this this quote it goes to Professor Matthias Shaw. He has been kind of mentor and he is in he uh, is in a lot of other areas. He used to say that uh, obesity is above all it's a brain disease. It's all about what's inside your brain, whether it's a thought, whether it's behavior. It's not about running. It's not about you know doing flexibility and all those kinds of exercise. It's about what is inside your brain. Even those who are sedentary. Those do a lot of you know uh, mathematics work uh, uh, with the brain. They tend to remain lean. You would have already seen you know people like a lot of people uh, working a lot and being you know fit without doing exercise. So that is what uh, and, and what happens in brain is that there is there is something called a sympathetic outflow and a parasympathetic outflow from the brain, especially vagus. Now vagus is something and even today we do not know. What to what extent in humans? I'm talk, not talking about the primates or the mouse. In humans, what is its role? I have data and I have published data with yoga, those with autonomic functional testing, all that. And it's it's so you know uh, somehow you know the parasympathetic outflow, which is mostly by Vegas, is is magical. You know, there's got so many effects both ways. In diabetic, for example, we see parasympathetic going away. So once the parasympathetic system, you know, the vagus nerve goes. Patients start becoming obese. So, so, so uh, uh, there is one part, and apart from that, there's a lot of gut hormones. Uh, most well-known gut hormone for uh, for us is um, the incretin hormones. But apart from that, there's also like myelin and secretin and cholecystokinin. So, what these hormones do uh, is that they, especially the incretin effect, that causes uh, that leads to satiety, and all of the gut hormones, I'm saying all of the gut hormones have a receptor inside the blood brain barrier. So this is the way, this is how, you know, the gut communicates with brain by the way of appetite. But brain is not something, you know, just it talks to the gut. Brain itself has got, you know, that two main pathways for that one is NPY and PMRC card pathway. So uh, the, uh, the anorexic and the orexic segments, they act on that. And there's a final common uh, pathway for uh, melanocyte C4 uh, receptor and also the PET Y receptors. So why it is important is that uh, we see there's a lot of patients who are mutation with MC4 um, receptors. Here there's a new drug which is available which acts on it and the obesity vanishes like MP. It's a very rare disease to have those mutations. Why I'm telling is that uh, in, in the ego precision medicine, once we find out what is it, whether the person is in a particular pathway defect, we can target that. And that can lead to miraculously you know, uh, weight loss. Maybe I'm talking about you know, 50 kg weight loss in one year, that without any adverse effect, without any ball stones, without any superosis, those things. This is the, uh, in most of these pathways have been targeted. 
plugin device included in GLP one and one included in the affect somewhere here, and then the Rimona band which is two affect somewhere here. A lot of amphetamine like drugs they act at the hedonic signals, which is they act on the anorexic signals. You are missing part. Then there's also CCK, oxyntomodulin. These are two which have not been exploited. That is, we don't have drugs for them, but we do have drugs for JP1. So we have at present drugs which act on the anorexic signals. The uh, drugs inhibiting the oligic signals. They are in the path of development, but they are not getting to the So just a look why is more or less, you know, a uh, uh, history of uh, anti diet, anti obesity drugs. All of these they have been withdrawn. And Rimona band, I remember the first patient I gave Rimona band that was, I think, 14 to 15 years back, 2007, I think it was launched. And that patient had seen a depression. Patient told that I had a depression. Subsequently, I discontinued it. And thereafter, because of psychiatric uh, you know, uh, problems, Rimona band was withdrawn. So, uh, same happened with Lorca cell. And Lorca cell is just like uh, two years back, it was withdrawn just before COVID. It was kind of a drug which would cause 10% weight loss in six months. And it, when it became available in India, I started giving and as such, there were no adverse effects. But then it was found that the chances of uh, small cell uh, lung carcinoma were increased. So it was withdrawn by the US FDA, and that's why subsequently in India also the withdrawal is not present. So this is what you know um, of all that like for anti-diabetic drug, anti hepatitis drug. We don't have these kind of things that drug coming is so good and then it has to go away because they have a lot of unacceptable adverse effects. So why it happens with anti anti-obesity drug is probably because the pathways are very complex. Most of the pathways they are also common to the uh, you know hypertension and also the cancers. That's why sibutramine was withdrawn because it was again a wonderful anti drug. When FEM lead to pulmonary hypertension, it was there for almost 40 years, 1970. Eventually, it was withdrawn in 1997. Both of these days to work in the brain in the anti is the, uh, I would say, it's, it's a drug which has been there for quite long, and uh, we are very adept in using it. It's also available from, from the, you know, all the complex compared to each other. Generics are also available. So what it does, it causes uh, uh, inhibition of gastrointestinal uh, lipase as a result of which the, the food which the oil and the fatty food that is, you know, uh, is not absorbed, but the patient has, you know, steatorrhea, so a lot of patients have problems. So, but it has, you know, it can lead to a 6 7 kg weight loss over 3 months. Personally, it's not, I have never given you 120 mg to any patient. With 60 to 120 BD, it will have a kind of weight loss and increasing the dose to TDS, which is recommended, will not have a better effect. Also, Olistat had been associated with the progression of chronic kidney disease. So, that will be, you know, uh, be um, uh, uh, like uh, not, uh, don't use in, in high doses. In Indian setting, it's an ideal dose to be used at BMR of 35. Somebody who is like, you know, any BMR of about 30, 35 in Indian setting. You see the diet is they are not taking a lot of calories. So they are taking like 20 to calories. And most of the calories in Indian patients, it's by the way of carbohydrates. You cannot target carbohydrates by the whole diet. Only, but yes, there are some patients who take a lot of you know junk foods. So those patients, it's an idea. But in this scenario, it doesn't have much of a role because of our own you know uh, unique dietary profile. And that's across all of India. Uh, carbs are the major component. Uh, it's a drug of choice in maintenance. Uh, somebody has lost weight by any way. So, even if somebody has lost by a lifestyle intervention, and then they say we have lost 700 kg, I tell you, okay, you just continue from uh, because you know they would be rebound with them. So, it prevents the rebound that way it can be. So, overall, it's not very cases. Now, metformin is probably the most the oldest and the uh, obesity therapy, which is still. It's also, it's basically, as you know, it's an anti diabetic drug. So, what is does it is that it has been shown to you know reduce uh, pre diabetes diabetes progression by way of like 3 to 5 kg weight loss. But the metabolic benefit of metformin it outstrips the weight loss. Suppose the weight loss is 5 kg with a lifestyle and 5 kg with metformin. With 5 kg metformin, actually, there will be a lot of metabolic advantages. Uh, Advantages probably, you know, in, like for example, increase in the insulin sensitivity. 
it will much higher if it is similar weight loss with any other. So, so it's more of anti-obesity drug in those who are having diabetes and those. Otherwise, in non-diabetic obesity, it's not much use. As you do, I have taken this because uh, these are anti-diabetic drugs. Sorry for the spelling mistake. It's SGLT2 inhibitors. There are three SGLT2 inhibitors available in India. Apart from this, one more, but I'm not taking that way. That um, it's a double closing, cannot closing, and ampagli closing. So the weight loss efficacy is highest when you give 300 mg of cannabis closing. And then DAPA also the DAPA closing, so that is good. Empathic was also positive weight loss, but the huge weight weight loss, you know, 10 kg something would be uh, would be seen with metformin and uh, as you do the The DAPA with metformin has been tried for weight loss in non-diabetic patients. So now I have I have very I think that diabetes itself is, has a brain component in its uh, psychological component in its analysis. So for a diabetic patient, as you do inhibitors, weight loss is very good. For non-diabetic also, it's good, but it won't work that much. Regardless, it has got a plateau, which means after three months, when somebody has lost a six or five kgs, that there won't be any further weight. Somebody who is 110 kg will become like 100 kg. So again, that's a huge improvement. The patient will be so happy with that because there's improve, improvement in lifestyle and all that. Uh, but uh, the, because of the plateau effects, it's not actually a very um, uh, targeted weight loss drug. Especially as compared to drugs which I am going to discuss. So, bupropen nitrogen is not available in India. Um, it's available uh, by the name brand of contract in the United States of America. It has nitrogen, extended group, bupropen, and both of these are extended uh, use. Off label uh, use of both nitrogen and bupropen is available. In India is available bupropen 150 mg, nitrogen 50 mg. But we also we tell the patient to take half nitric zone and other bupropan. So and it has causes some improvement in HB1C. But as such, I've seen a lot of the patients develop uh, hypertension or a worsening of hypertension occurs in patients. And this is not uh, a known effect of contrary in US, it's probably because we use 150 mg extended release in India uh, separately bupropan. Bupropan can lead to hypertension. That might be reason. Now, alpha uh, use is associated with a weight loss. So, we can cause the patient to lose like 6 to 10 kg in 3 months when we do this combination. And this is another combination. Pentamine is a old one, which is a So, it has to be tried it is available in DG strength 3.75. The pentamine uh, has to be in immediate release because if it is not in immediate release, it will lead to its addiction. That is a problem with pentamine. So uh, regardless, we have only a topiramate in India. So what I do is that the patients who are in bipolar disorder and also in diabetes. So I just tell the scatters to prefer topiramate and maybe topiramate. So that's how you know. If there's comorbidity, then topiramate is also useful. And uh, we can have the combination as for the literature, we can have 10 kg weight loss. The topiramate alone, I've been able to have a weight loss of 5 to 6 kg over half of it. This, um, but yes, it's limited, you know, you cannot use outside those who are making psychiatric disorders, you don't use. Also, as compared to uh, kidney, sorry, uh, contract, contract is mostly should be used in the non diabetic subjects. In diabetic subjects, contract has not got the weight loss uh, uh, shown in the uh, yes. So this is just a division of it. Uh, off which only you know only steps are put in India. Liraglutide is available, and we give off label support in India. Simaglutide is not available, not approved, but it's available in oral form. So um, and simaglutide is a very recent molecule, and it's it's you know a weight loss efficacy which has not been shown in India. Not seen even on the you know uh, if you see on the uh, on the literature also. There has been shortage of injected simaglutide all over the world because of its weight loss benefit. And after, after it doesn't have any adverse effect, after well, very less adverse effect on, on, on smell. So, uh, simaglutide, uh, once this was an energy in paper, even before this paper came out, of patients were using for, like, for uh, uh, weight loss. I had a very limited experience with injectable simaglutide because it is not available in India. 
oral semen thread is available uh, by the name of Gravel cells. And I have a few patients I'm talking about here with loss to 20 kg plus in three, four months is it for long. So, so it is a huge efficacy in that. And we have to combine dietary information with it, and then it becomes a very good, uh, it a good result. Now, semen thread can be combined with an amylin analog, which is a uh, why it is important is that as well, I was discussing the various pathways, there is no drug which acts on the myelin uh, pathway uh, till now. So, pregnant could be one of the drugs. Uh, the data is with the phase one trial, which is a lot of weight down to me at this That is what the complementary mechanism action, if you see. Pregnant it, it acts on the meal generated segments, which is, you know, uh, amino acids. Suppose you have taken something. We have taken soup. You want to eat more because soup goes and it's gone and it causes a use of resistive kidney and that goes and gives a signal to the So that is inhibited. So the meal, if, if, if you tell the patient to eat, eat slowly, probably with kidney and that patient will not eat you know, much. So, and with that, simulator combining simulator, we have intermittent weight loss. This would be a very potent uh, weight loss drug. And, and this is an altogether different, uh, you know. Uh, level, we never got a, we never saw drugs which were for 10 kg plus weight loss in three months or two, three months in most patients. So, these are the SGA2 because ZA2 and loss, this one is very and one more, you know, the 10 kg SIMA is that you scheduled, that is potential to provide without compromising quality. This, and of course, there is no adverse money at all. We have seen that in, by the family type. That is the limiting Now, this is something in last three months, this was the energy particle at the This is but it is actually a type 2 diabetes drug, but the efficacy of A1C reduction as well as the weight loss was so huge, it was striking. It was a to the tune of you know A1C getting to 2.4. I would suggest to read that article which they have done Sima Kutad versus Kisya Patai, uh, uh, you know, head to head trial. So this is in 2022, I think, maybe in March, we should have energy. So it, outside diabetes, also it has got good weight loss, but we have very good evidence with the quality of parsity in diabetic patients. And uh, these are all the facts that I'm Now that I'm talking about the drugs which are in the pipeline, not have not come with the publication in the quiz for trial. This are one is the below then it was an anti-IGV antigenistic inhibitor. It was found to have you know uh the production of new fatty acid molecules in the liver and converts the stored fats into useful energy. So the what we call non-exercise related thermogenesis that increases with this below level. So it's a very different, you know, it doesn't act on the brain particles, it just acts on the visceral fat and causes it to uh, causes you know uh, increases gamma. So this way it's, uh, it could be useful, uh, but we do not have any data about human data. Then there is a test, test of cancer, it's a monoamine uh, DNA inhibitor. So it increases the four band dopamine in the, uh, in the mouse. So it's a sexual motivation signal when four band in increased the mice. So it's more or less, you know, it could lead to uh, something of more of a physiological uh, weight loss in which, you know, I think that a lot of uh, whistle fat of this drug. Citrus so is just a cousin of stat, but it's much more, you know, uh, uh, to the nature of uh, uh, this. That is a obesity, uh, uh, it's, it's, it could be very useful. Now, uh, fibroblast, uh, this is a family of fibroblast group factors, which is abused in bone and many metabolic cells. 21 is, is one of them that expressed in liver. It's also formed an adipose tissue skeleton system and more important in pancreas, it, it nourishes the ileic cells. It functions as a metabolic regulator and, and, uh, and it leads to the loss in, in good vessels. The molecule has a multiple target elements as an auto and an Novel agents, so what are these? Is that uh, it can be a vaccine obesity. Uh, because what happens is that uh, the ghrelin is released, it's hunger hormone used to only eat the hunger. So when you give the anti-ghrelin, so your hunger signal stops, so you never not feel hunger. So 
Actually, the, the best thing about this antibody is that probably it will act peripherally. It will not act in the blood brain barrier. We can have an antibody which will not cause blood brain barrier. Because when once any drug causes brain, uh, brain gets a lot of adverse effect and that leads to withdrawal of the brain field of the drug. So this will be should have. I think that there should be very specific antibodies targeted to the stomach brain receptors only. That will be useful. Then uh, set melanotype. Now uh, I was talking about you know that MC4 part is an end result of uh, of the whole uh, this study and the genetic difference upstream of MC4 receptor uh, like the bonded with the Alstom syndrome they are associated with the obesity. This has uh, been shown to have uh, weight loss in patients from bonded with the as well as Alstom syndrome. These are very very rare diseases. And, but why it is important is that a lot of patients could have partial polymorphism of these receptors in which this drug could be useful. That's why I put it here. This could be otherwise useful in also. So then metal leptin, again, this is uh, last two years, uh, there have been kind of you know a lot of drugs come and publication have come with this. There's something called generalized lipodiscopy, it's an intractable endocrine disease. So it has been it's a leptin analog, it can you know. Um, this leptin deficiency so that is to be stop. So it inhibits leptin deficiency because leptin is not, but it can also, as we know, obesity has to be leptin resistance. So it can be given to obese patients uh, to overcome the leptin resistance and then cause weight loss by the leptin resistance overcome. And there is also zonisomat glucopoin combination, just like Prismia. Uh, it uh, is just uh, carbonic anhydrase and it suppresses the and it includes the hunger score, which means it acts primarily at the brain. Now, uh, uh, and you can, yeah, therapies are the only therapies in the, in, from in the anti obesity drugs who are as such, they are not, none of them entities that can have been withdrawn. Because of, so, I have a lot of hope for indicating therapies. And we have in future, we see a lot of indicating molecules also. And this is not hard going on. Most of these they are being developed for diabetes, but they will turn out to be eventually an anti obesity device as a tool of a pressure pattern. There's also glucosamide, which is actually a JT1, you know, analog uh, antibodies to JT1 cell. So, so now these things uh, they would cause a rapid weight loss initially, and uh, they also on uh, this also something called triple agonist. There's agonism of JT1. GL2 as well as the one. And there's a hormone called zinctomodulin. So zinctomodulin, it's they are mostly based on oxymodulin like effects. Oxymodulin, the good thing about that there is no plateau in If you keep on giving to mice, mice will give you a and keep on losing it. So that way it's uh, these are and there's again uh, I think uh, trial case one which is being they will have effect not only on the on obesity, but they will also lead to you know better muscle development because that's how the action is. They have they have effect on most forces, and that's why I especially when it's like in patients, this is most promising of novel drugs. This combines the gene linked effects with the other effects of uh, the and a lot of people are going to study. Uh, at the end, this last slide, I uh, put uh, some already these. So, my personal opinion in the future, the anti obesity drug will be divided into induction agent, just like we have induction radiation for you know, SAD or something. So, we have an agent which should induce the weight loss, and then there will be maintenance uh, agents. There are a lot of anti aging therapies, anti diabetic therapies. So, many anti aging therapies, and almost all of the anti diabetic therapies will actually be an anti obesity. That's how it's going to be. Lifestyle intervention will take a back seat. Uh, once upon a time, for particular myocardial infarction, there's still lifestyle intervention, you can just sit there. Don't walk otherwise, myocardial infarction. Now we have aspirin, we have angiography, angioplasty, everything. So, uh, in future, I think lifestyle intervention will take a back seat. They have a lot of drugs, just take a drug and you become young and you can become you know, uh, lean also with muscles, everything. The so normal GP1 analog and GP1 receptor antibody, as I discussed, an agent inhibitor would be likely inducing it. Induce the weight loss. The maintenance agent would be like Kirzepatan, Quizmia, or this. And these will be the maintenance agents. The combination of agents will be mostly used for long maintenance. Just we do, you know, for diabetes, we give drugs, so they will be a long time, you know, 10 years to be given drugs. This ends my presentation, and there is an email because I'm already interested in collaborations and everything. So,
Thank you, Dr. Ravindra Shukla, for such an informative presentation. You have highlighted very important aspects regarding management of obesity, especially related to drugs. And of course, you have mentioned the newer drugs also. Uh, would you like to take up some of the questions which are there in the chat box from the audience? Yeah, yeah there are a lot of questions. I think I, I start yeah. from the... Uh, One of the questions is regarding the side effects of the drugs, especially with the SGLT2 and their risk of development of genitourinary infections. Yeah, they are the most, you know, irritable uh, adverse effects, genital, especially fungal infection. Fortunately, most of the genital infection, they are limited to lower urinary tract. And that's why SGLT2 inhibitors have, and they are very efficacious drugs. Apart from that, uh, and we, can, we can treat it by giving antifungal or, you know, a local application of antifungal as well. So, uh, uh, yeah, that is an adverse effect taken. But uh, it doesn't lead to stoppage in many cases, most of the patients. In okay. fact, SGLT2 inhibitors are very, I think, one of the most commonly used drugs that I need. Okay, sir. Next question is that regarding the absorption related questions, one is that uh, what should be the gap between Orlistat and Levothyroxine if they both are prescribed together to avoid absorption related drug interactions? I think I would keep at it six hours. That I would keep at least six hours, which means yeah. in the morning, so take the uh, Orlistat in the uh, you know, uh, uh, sometime in the uh, afternoon or something. But what happens is that when somebody takes a list of the set of five hours, so a uh, patient cannot run to toilet in the evening. So that's the problem. I avoid giving a list at that time uh, with, with you both have. So now I tell the patient that you need to go to in the evening, you might be quite to go to the toilet. So, so, so that is a practical difference. Yes, sir. And one more is that. Uh, what about the absorption challenges with fat soluble micronutrients, especially when patient is on early state? Yes, uh, so we have to give vitamin D to these patients. I have seen after one year or something of early set, uh, especially even if the low doses we are giving, they become vitamin D you know, uh, fat soluble or fat soluble vitamin deficiency levels. Whether vitamin E should be given, that's a controversial. I don't give vitamin E, I give vitamin D. Uh, Vitamin A, uh, uh, if the patient we are giving only to younger children, so it is approved for 12 years also, we have to give vitamin A supplementation to them. The children, they might they develop uh, vitamin D deficiency, we have to give them vitamin D as well. It's a long term, not like three, six months, but yes, after three months. Yes, sir. Thank you. And one more question is there, how smoking is helpful in reducing the weight and is there any beneficial dose? <laughs> yeah. Uh, Smoking uh, leads to, you know, uh, it suppresses the appetite by way of nicotine uh, receptors, okay? That said, smoking is not at all um, an anti obesity or anti obesity drug. Uh, it leads to, you know, more uh, chance of cardiovascular event and all that. So, um, more than smoking as an anti obesity, what happens is that when the smoking is stopped, patients tend to gain the weight. So, we, as a doctor, we have to, like, be careful that you have to see that part. So it's mostly it's separate from the, uh, the nucleus porulus and the addiction pathway. By way, by way, just like eating disorder, anorexia nervosa also. There will be lost, somebody who has anorexia nervosa will not gain weight. But that doesn't mean that it's actually some kind of anti, uh, you know, uh, obesity or anti, anti obesity. Okay, thank you so much, sir. Okay, thank you. I think uh, this finishes our all the scientific sessions for the day for the webinar. Now I would like to invite Dr. Shubha Singhal to deliver a vote of thanks. Thank you, ma'am. Good evening, all. Thank you is such a prayer which cannot be seen or touched. It must be felt by the heart. I, Dr. Shubha Singhal, Assistant Professor in the Department of Pharmacology in Rajkot, on behalf of Department of Physiology and Department of Pharmacology, Ames Rajkot feels privileged and honored to get this opportunity to propose vote of thanks on this special occasion. First of all, I would like to say thanks to our guest of honor, Dr. R.S. Trivedi, sir, Professor and Head, Department of Physiology, PDU Medical College, 
and principal and president appi gujarat chapter and dr dimple mehta professor and head department of pharmacology cu shah medical college surendranagar and executive member of appi gujarat chapter that they accept our invitation and spare their precious time from their busy schedule i appreciate all the honorable delegates who blessed us with their presence and active participation in the webinar i am also very much thankful to all the invited speakers dr pradeep barde dr tejas dr h varun sharma dr tejas patel and dr ravind ji shukla who gave us their valuable time and enlightened us with their valuable and vast knowledge and experience i on behalf of the organizing committee convey deep regards and hearty thanks to our honorable executive director colonel professor dr cds katoj sir who supported us in all possible manner to organize this webinar i would like to thank our beloved head of the department of physiology and dean academics dr vivek sharma sir for his constant help and guidance that radiated a source of energy within us i would also like to thank our organizing secretary dr rajesh katuria additional professor department of physiology and joint organizing secretary dr reema shah associate professor and in charge of the department of pharmacology for their hard work and perseverance to make this webinar a successful event we convey our sincere regards to both of you sir and ma'am an event cannot happen overnight the wheels start rolling months before we have been fortunate enough to be backed by a team of a very motivated and dedicated faculty members and resident i cannot thank everyone enough for the involvement they have shown and the willingness they have expressed to take on the completion of tasks beyond their comfort zone in the last i would like to say thanks to all the non teaching staff who stand by us who always stand by us i feel proud and thank you for making this event a successful one if time is the money then today you all have spent millions for us thanks to all of you for making this event wonderful have a wonderful evening thank you uh thank you very much uh, dr shubha i thank each and every person who has been a part of it uh, as i have told that this is being attended over from all the parts of the world and uh, uh, it is a proud privilege for me to be a part of this uh, organizing committee and on the behalf of all the organizing committee i also assure that we are going to continue all these types of the academic activities in future also and we are going to be having series of the talks on the related topics of the pharmacological and the physiological aspects of the body composition where we would like to incorporate uh, many untouched areas which are uh, which are definitely imminent something where we can all make a difference and we would like to take it both in the front of the academics and as well as what are the research avenues that open up we would like to invite the people from other parts of the world also thank you very much thanks to once and all thank you switch out Yeah. Uh -huh.